building that roughly equates to approximately 12 acres. That's reflected in the late representation. And where members minded to um, support the officer report, it is proposed to on that recommendation. One of those to limit or to uh, restrict and ensure that all the machinery and equipment is actually housed within the agricultural building that forms part of the application. And the second uh, condition that's proposed is for the um, limited or to limit the size of the actual residential cartilage associated with the building, the former barn that was converted into the class Q. But that is relation, in relation to a topographical plan uh, number and that's references put number two within the actual late representation. So those two conditions where members might have supported. Now, if I can just draw members' attention to the presentation, I, I know that it was part of um, the members' site visit, so I'll just skip through some of the actual um, slides. The slide that's up there at the moment, the, the green line, it's, it's, it is visible, but basically to, it surrounds the actual building that's shaded yellow, that is the actual extent of the residential cartilage that's been proposed to be regularised as part of this application. And members will note that the actual site itself is, or from reading the papers, is a retrospective planning application and it's seeking to regularise the unauthorised engineering operations and the regrading of the land and the building, the agricultural building, uh, for use and the um, residential cartilage in connection with the conversion. The site itself is in the open countryside. It's between um, Boylston and um, Marston Montgomery. Forgive me if that pronunciation is incorrect. Uh, the property sits to the rear of uh, Cottonwood Grange and uh, Cottonwood Lodge. And there's agricultural land to the north, east and west. There has been a number of um, objections or concerns raised from two residents and the parish council relating to light pollution, the requirement for the agricultural building itself, the new agricultural building that is. The impact on the amenity of the residential properties, highway impact, impact on drainage, and an inappropriate form of development in the open countryside. Whilst the building or application itself includes some other residential properties, and the members will note there was some residential paraphernalia on the site, the development itself is not considered to be inappropriate and an unacceptable form of development in the open countryside and subject to those conditions, the additional conditions and those set out within the report, the officer's um, recommendations support the proposal as written. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Can I just remind members that we're into questions, not statements, please. You know, you can make larger statements and comments in the actual debate, please. So uh, can I invite questions, perhaps? Councillor Slack. Thank you, Chair. Um, is, um, I know there's a condition on the, for agricultural building, only agricultural machinery can be put in there, nothing else can be stored in there, but is there a time limit on, can they come back in, in eight, say, eight years, ten years and, and get to, it changed over to some other con, that condition taken away again, or is it permanent? Through you, Chair. Um, so basically the the condition itself will require that that machinery to be stored in that building. I think what you're possibly trying to get at, Councillor, is could it be converted to anything other than agricultural storage? Well, that in itself would require permission, which we'd have to consider in the round and based on its merits. But I know certainly because of that condition that's on there, because of the age of the building, and it doesn't predate when the Class Q came about, it wouldn't benefit from that permitted development to convert it from agricultural an agricultural building to a residential usage because that condition would effectively time it out. Councillor Peter Dobbs. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, when we uh, visited the site, um, assuming that the conditions of the Class Q permission had been adhered to, what wouldn't we have seen? Would that be, we wouldn't have seen the gazebo or uh, any of the, the land, the raised land at the back, that would all have been just agricultural land? That's correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Boothroyd. Just a question. It's got permitted for the, for the existing barn. Is that just for domestic and not commercial? And if they wanted to convert it into any sort of commercial operation, they would require planning permission for that? Through you, Chair. Sorry. So, so the question is the 
um, so the ban that's being proposed to be retained as part of this application is that what you're relating to the or the mean the the class q form of ban well that's residential usage so if they want to then convert part of it or the whole extent to residential sorry other, anything other than residential to commercial or to retail then that in itself would need permission i invite the co-chair of the planning committee councillor o'brien uh, thank you chair um john do you not think it uh appropriate given this is a partly retrospective application that the details of the landscaping uh, should have been both submitted and approved before any, any construction starts on the agricultural building that the sorry uh, through you chair the condition number three on page 26 obviously it has that three month period and when it must be submitted to and approved um that's set out as the, within the report. I mean, the yes, we could alter that. Whether that to remember members' mind to do so, to vote on that, we could actually tweak that to actually ask for those details to be agreed. I'm really asking whether you thought that would be appropriate. Normally, we ask for details of landscaping to be supplied and agreed before any construction work start. And through you again, Chair, if I may, um, yes. In short, yes, that should be, uh, be worded appropriately. Mm. Councillor Stewart Lees. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, in the representation, it, it states about the uh, lighting on the fence, down the fence, and yesterday on the site visit, we were told that that had been uh, addressed. Is that correct? There is a condition, condition number seven, that requires for the actual lighting, or limiting the lighting, or do you mean the actual unauthorised lighting on the fencing? The unauthorised lighting that's down the fence as you go down the side of the buildings. Yes, that's correct. That has now been addressed. That's been yeah. being addressed or been addressed? Indeed. It is, has been addressed, yes. Right. Uh, Councillor Buttle. Uh, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make the site visit yesterday. There seems to be a dreadful amount of hard standing here. Are we sure that there is going to be no increase in water flow onto shared spaces? Uh, Sean? Yes, I mean, whenever you, through your chair, sorry, um, whenever you actually increase or remove any permeable surface, yes, you are increasing water flow and areas for it to go. Or well, it has to go somewhere. Um, the application in itself doesn't include a drainage provision but there, certainly that should be drained appropriately and should, shouldn't cause any additional runoff to the residential properties that exist or to the, the property itself. I mean it, again this is part of retrospect of this application where members minded to do so we could ask for a scheme to be submitted to and agreed. Thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, if it's okay I would very much like us to have a bit of consideration for uh, water water runoff and what have you once we get to the conditions. Right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Are there any further questions before we go into debate now? Uh, Councillor Boynton. Chair, yeah, I just wondered if we know if there is any other land associated with these premises um, on the basis that the, the hay's been mentioned and the size of the building to... Um, contend with the, the amount of hay that the 12 acres will produce. Um, however, you can't have both. Either you've got animals on the land or you've got hay growing. You can't have both. So if you're growing hay to keep in the barn, then why do you need the hay if you haven't got animals on the land? So hence my question, do we know if there's any other land associated with this, please? Uh, Sean, please. Yes, sir, through you, through you, Chair. Um, just in terms of the slide that's uh, up at the moment, uh, members, the area that's in, outlined in blue, that's the extent of the actual ownership of the applicant. The additional ownership, the, the blue line. John, have you any further questions? Do you follow on? Do you, no, that's you, you're okay with that? Lovely. Yeah. I'd, I'd like us to perhaps move now into debate. Now, is any member at this point prepared to either move the officer recommendation or an alternative one for refusal? You're happy to move it. Does that, uh, thank you, Councillor Wyden. Does that find a seconder, please, uh, Councillor O'Brien? It's now been formally moved. I would, I would second it with the additional recommendation, uh, additional conditions suggested.
through myself and Councillor Buttle. Now, members, um, you've got a motion before you. Do you want to speak to the motion? If not, uh, Councillor Lillies. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'd just like to speak in debate. Um, I'm not personally happy with this uh, development at all. Um, so I'm, I'm not in favour of it, to be honest. Um, with regard to the condition on the barn, you can't have a barn to store stuff in and you know, have a condition that says you can't store stuff outside. It's either full of A or it's full of machinery. It can't be both. So it's very confusing on, as to what is actually going to be in that barn. It, like Councillor Boynton says, you can't have it full of A and have animals as well. It's very confusing on what it is actually going to be used for. I mean, when we saw a small bit of machinery yesterday when we were on site, nothing that you'd class as agricultural machinery as I saw. I'd, I'd just say it was domestic machinery. So I'm a little bit on the fence at the moment. I'll listen, wait till the rest of the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. It's Councillor Boothroyd. Yeah, the reason I asked the question about the commercial um, sort of a permission was that when we were on site, we noticed that actually there was permanent um, signage linked to the dog grooming business on the outside of the barn, which didn't indicate an occasional basis. And when we were sort of standing in the hard standing, to me, it felt very much like a car park rather than somewhere where you could potentially turn around a, essentially a sit-on mower in terms of agricultural equipment is what we could see parked outside. So I just question whether or not all of the reasons given here are things that they would actually adhere to. Thank you for those comments. Councillor Slack and then Councillor Dobbs. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, yesterday, similar to uh, Councillor Lees, I was very um, uh, not sure what was happening here. Uh, the barn's an enormous place, mm. isn't it, really? Yeah. And for the machinery, a lot of it's domestic garden machinery, most of it. There's some a cutting machinery, but... To, to, it's, the, the, the building is far too big for the machinery, unless we're going to store a lot of A as well, but we don't know. But uh, as long as nothing else is going in there, and it's got to be agricultural, we, it's abiding by the conditions. But I'm a bit sceptical, to be very honest. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Dobbs and then uh, Councillor Archer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, members have raised some um, very good points. But uh, I'm not sure on what planning grounds we could actually uh, make a different decision. There's a lot that is worrying, and uh, the concerns of local residents, and of course it's fairly sparsely populated, and so we've already got a fair, fair percentage of those being concerned. But in terms of um, uh, planning reasons, I'm not sure. Uh, so yes, I share your concerns, gentlemen, but um, I don't know what else we can do. Councillor Archer. So, sorry, yeah, yeah, come back. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, if I can just come back before Councillor Archer comes in. If it's um, of any assistance to members, the one of the proposed conditions, it's the last line there, that um, about the storage of uh, machinery within inside the building, um, or should not be stored outside of any building on the site without the prior approval in writing of the, the local planning authority. So, potentially, if you had the standoff between hay being stored in the building and the equipment that was used to actually um, cut that hay and actually compact that hay into bales and so forth, that in itself could be stored outside of the building, but it had to be agreed in writing prior to that happening. I don't know if that may assist members. Uh, Nick. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chair. So, yeah, I mean, similar to what Councillor Dobbs said, really, I wasn't on the site visit. I, was, I have a bugbear with retrospective applications, they wind me up, they get on the wrong side of me, and I want to say that because anyone else watching needs, needs to know that retrospective applications are much more likely to arouse suspicion. Mm. Um, and I think that's perhaps why we've got some doubts around, around the room from people who visited the site. I do know where the site is because I live quite close to it, but I wasn't on the site visit yesterday. However, in terms of planning um, law, I don't really see anything that we can turn this down ba based on any, anything to do with planning law. And also, as somebody from um, several generations of farmers, it is perfectly possible to store, to use a barn to store hay and machinery at the same time. If you've got space to do both, a lot of farmers will do that. That are part of the barn for machinery, part of the barn for hay. So on that, on that point, I'm not 
particularly suspicious, but there's lots of other things here that I am suspicious about and I'm uncomfortable about, partly it being retrospective and partly some of the other points raised, but again, when it comes to planning regulation, I don't really see how we can necessarily turn it down. Thank you, Councillor Archer. Are there any further Councillor Lees? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Chair, if I can come back on this one. Um, again, the doubts, like we've been saying, um, it's not too many months ago, it was the same place with the res retrospective application, and uh, here we are again with the same thing, retrospective with the same owner, same thing, and it just makes you wonder where it is going to stop. It just keeps happening on this site. And um, I think we've got uh, every ground to turn it down, if we should be minded to, on the principle of the development, impact on the character of the area, impact on the residential amenity. You know, if it's going to be a farm, you've gone residential and you've got all these people travelling down the side of that those buildings. So, just a point. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, councillors. I'd like to test then the motion, because if it falls, then we're in, in, into then, hopefully, someone proposing refusal. So, there is a motion before us. It's been moved by Councillor Nick Whitehead. It's been seconded by Councillor O'Brien that you support officer recommendation of consent. Will those in favour please clearly show? Against? Abstentions? we just do that again then, yeah, please? The, the, those in favour, please clearly show. One, two, three, four. Against? So the motion um, fails. Uh, it's back open then now to members. Uh, and obviously we need someone who's prepared to move refusal. Councillor Lees. Yes, Chair, thank you. I'll, I'll move uh, <clears throat> against officer recommendation on the, uh, the grounds of um, principle of the development, impact on the character of the area, and impact on the residential amenity. Does that find a seconder, please? Councillor Buttle, yeah. It's now open for members to comment, debate. If not, uh, Councillor Whitehead. I just, I just wonder whether what we're stating for grounds for refusal are strong enough and whether this will just, whether the applicant will just go to appeal and just overturn and uh, officers have recommended it. We're, we're half, kind of almost half split. To me, it seems obvious it will get overturned and appeal. So I, I kind of, I, I would ask people to reconsider. Can I ask then, Nick, uh, the planning officer, uh, Sean, it, in the light, I know you've gone for a, a consent, but, um, you know, Councillor Lees has just given us a, a list of reasons. What's your professional view, please? Uh, through you, Chair, I can just come back on some of those points. The, when you mentioned the impact of the character of the area, do you mean the impact of the character of the countryside, the open countryside, and that... That's what I can. So I'll just make a few point notes before I come back on this. The residential amenity impact on the two residential properties affected by that, that's Cottonwood and Cotton Lodge, Cottonwood Lodge. The only one out of those, these, the, only points, the only point, Chair, that's been mentioned is just the principle of development. The impact on the open countryside or the, how that will be integrated in the open countryside is very subjective. That doesn't mean it necessarily will, will, will be successful in defending it, but obviously it's a subjective point. Impact on residential amenity again, as per the previous point, again, subjective, that may or may not be defensible appeal. It's the first point, the principle of development. I mean, it, it, it is an agricultural location where you do, you would generally tend to find agricultural buildings. It's just how that would be at odds with that. Councillor Lees. Is there any grounds on that this um, applicant already had a barn and chose to turn it into residential under the park queue? Then he's gone again now for another barn because he's lost his barn that he had. So it just doesn't doesn't fit right with me, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, through your chat. In short, no, unfortunately. Um, the fact that they've converted a barn that did benefit from Park Q, and then they need a, another provision or 
further provisions in itself. The legislation doesn't take account of that. So unfortunately, they can do that. And it doesn't necessarily negate the requirement or rationale for requiring another ban. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Neil. Um, thank you, David. Um, I, th I have a feeling that this is actually not great for your local wildlife. The comment about their lighting and what have you in the proposed agricultural building uh, comments below that next one, page 21. And I'm linking that in with Stuart's mention of the principle of development. And I do wonder whether or not we are creating a nuisance for moths, bats, what have you, by people who don't seem to have a deal of care. And that's my main concern, and that's why I'm quite happy to support Stuart at this point. Thank you, you Councillor Buttle. Uh, Councillor Whitehead. I don't think I wanted to speak. You're OK, sorry. Yeah. Councillor yeah. O'Brien. Thank you, Jim. I, I, I share colleagues' concerns about uh, retrospective applications. Uh, I don't think they... I, I share concerns, so I say no more than that. However, I think if we analyse the components of this application in turn, uh, we know that the applicant um, has a land holding of around 12 acres, I think, I think about 12 acres. And I think it's quite justified that uh, he or she should uh, have consent to erect an agricultural building uh, in order to uh, utilise that 12 acres. I think it's entirely reasonable. Um, the other part of the, of the application relates to the retention of a number of outbuildings, uh, a couple of pergolas and um, some, some decking. Um, associated with the uh, barn converted to a residential dwelling. They might not be to everyone's tastes, but um, I think given the, the situation that it is a, um, a, a relatively isolated um, dwelling, uh, well... Uh, well landscaped uh, in relation to the adjoining property, I, I don't think those are, are inappropriate. Um, the hard standing is is perhaps uh, a different issue. Um, it is it, it's effectively a, 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 a gravelled, um, a landscape chipped area. Um, you could call it a parking area. It's called a hard standing. Uh, but we are asking for details of that uh, to be provided and um, th they can be controlled and adapted uh, so that it, um, it's perhaps more appropriate to um, its juxtaposition with uh, the dwelling and the, and the barn. Um, and I'm, I'm always prepared to give applicants the benefit of the doubt. I don't, uh, I'm not naturally a suspicious person. I mean, I, I, I think we, we need to uh, encourage uh, local entrepreneurship. So, as I said, I'm, I'm, I think the conditions associated with that, this application are, are appropriate and give our officers um, uh, every reason to ensure that uh, um, if the development were given consent, it would not result in the sort of harm that uh, some colleagues have suggested. Uh, that's why I'm, I, I don't feel able to support a recommendation to refuse. Thank members for the comments. I think we've had a good discussion. Can I just test then now, please, uh, the motion? All those that support a refusal, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five, six. Against? Two, three, four, five. Is that right? You're abstaining, right? Uh, abstentions, please. That's, that's one abstention. Yeah. So, and so, so, so the. Um, yeah, the uh, motion stands, and uh, it's been refused.
We turn then to the second application. Right, uh, Sh Sean, can I just clarify, um, in terms of refusal, you, the list that Councillor Lees gave, and um, is it possible uh, over the next couple of days for members who perhaps could contact you and give... Yes, I mean, certainly, yeah. yes, the, the, there's, there's sufficient there to work with, yeah. Right, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. So we turn to page uh, 31, construction of one number dwelling house and associated garage. And I'd like to call at this point uh, Mr. Ian Strange of Tansley Parish Council. And Mr. Strange is going to speak against the application. Uh, Ian, you've got three minutes. Thank you. Uh, I thank the committee to listen to the concerns of the uh, Parish Council. Um, we question why there are 20, 10 properties on this development which are on the approval awaiting a decision, some of them being occupied. A drainage verification report is required prior to occupancy. Where is this? Plot 11 is already half built and differs significantly from the original plans with a lot larger footprint and no indication of landscaping. The next point is the plan on uh, five dot two on the, uh, uh, on the agenda. Uh, this plan, uh, in my mind, is incorrect. Um, as the applicant owns all the way up to the top of Thatcher's Lane, and it is wider, he owns wider than what is shown here. If you go on Google Earth, you'll find out what Thatcher's Lane used to look like before it was widened. At the last um, application on this site, I pointed out that this, the part of Thatcher's Lane was still in the ownership of, uh, of the developer. And Mr. Whitmore um, said that he would contact the uh, Derbyshire County Council to find out uh, and to come to an agreement to have this part of the Thatcher's the public highway adopted. As we're going to finish up, um, all the taxpayers in this, in, in this room are going to finish up paying for repairs on this road. And it's a public highway and the part owned by the developer should be adopted. We have been to DC, the Derbyshire County Council, and looked at all the uh, relevant um, information regards this. When this, it was a condition put on by the District Council to widen this road for the, this, this development. Um, the, the developer refused to, or didn't, answer any of the letters uh, sent to them by District Count uh, by Derbyshire County Council regards um, putting a bond up and widening the road and having it adopted. He didn't answer any of this. He just went ahead and did it on his own back, and so there was no approval given. We contacted Derbyshire County Council to find out what could be done about this, and they said because it was a condition of Derbyshire Dales had put on that the road had to be widened, it was up to Derbyshire Dales to enforce the condition that the road was adopted. And this is totally wrong, and I, I would, that's really all, all we've got to say, but perhaps the, the, the committee would be mindful either to refuse this application or at least defer it until this road is sorted out. It's not right that we have a public highway in partly owned by a developer. It's totally wrong and I'll, I'll keep bringing this up as long as we can go. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Ian. Um, Sean, at this point, could you respond to any of the points that have perhaps been raised on behalf of the Tansley Parish Council, please? Sorry, Chair, through you, if I may. In terms of the actual, um, well, in no particular order, I've jotted down all the points that were mentioned there, that the application itself in front of members today, it, it does differ from what was uh, approved as part of the hybrid application. 
The hybrid application, when it was granted um, back in uh, 2022, on the 4th of November, that related to five dwellings approved in full, full details considered, and an additional 12 units on the actual site. This plot, plot number 11, forms one of those 12 units. Now, whilst that included an indicative layout and um, orientation of those units within the site, well, whilst it's not an ideal situation to be in, the developer has progressed with the development. Therefore, it cannot benefit, or, or you, you could not, the developer couldn't submit a reserve matters on part of what was the hybrid application, the outline consent for those 12 units. The most straightforward way of doing this um, in planning legislation, planning law, is a full application to be considered, which is what's in front of members this evening. Um, in terms of the adoption of the actual road itself, Thatcher's Lane, that in itself, it can be adopted at a certain point. And forgive me, I don't have any information from the moment from the county council to say when that triggers, that trigger would reach. But once you have a private road, it is the normal practice to have no more than five of a private road unless it's adopted or an adoptable standard. That is something, there's a bond that's generally paid and there's a period of time, again, that's set down by the highway authority, in this particular case, the county council, what the develop the the road must be kept to a suitable standard before they will adopt it, just in case there's any imperfections or issues with the road itself. So that it isn't overnight to get adopted. There is a period of time or a running period before it's actually adopted. Um, in terms of the actual occupation on the site, it was my understanding it wasn't ten that were occupied. It was only a lesser number than that. But I'm just checking that point now, Chair. Uh, questions, Councillor Whitehead, please. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Uh, Sean, just to, just to clarify a couple of things that you said there. Did you say, uh, and also what the parish council said? So we've given outline plan permission, but they've gone ahead and started just building it all anyway. No, is that, is that normal? No, sorry, no. Um, we've given, forgive me, my apologies. We've given outline. Effectively, it was an the original application was an application of two halves. There was five dwellings that were all the details considered and approved. There was an additional 12 that was basically considered as an outline, so the principle of development was agreed on those sites. Yeah. And forgive me, my apologies, I was reading off the wrong sheet. A number of those have come forward with the reserve matters for those units that, coincide, that effectively activate that application. So the original application itself had a timing on it that the reserve matters must be submitted within three years of the date of the permission. So the date of the permission was the 4th of November 2022. So within three years of that date, the reserve matters must be submitted. That has happened, so the application is now effectively a full application. Okay. But what they're doing here on this particular site doesn't accord with that application. Because this is just about one property. Indeed, yes. So, thank you, that, that helps clarify. But okay. so my second kind of question was just around, you, do you consider that this developer is acting in good faith? If we've made commitments to sort the road out, and from what we hear, I do go to Tansley quite often, Nothing's, nothing's happened on that road. So it seems like quite a long time ago. They've had quite a long time to be able to sort of get that road to a standard where it could then be fully adopted or we could have the conversations with the high. And it just seems like none of that has happened. And I just wondered, as a committee, should we even consider this if, if the developer's not acting in good faith? Thank you, Councillor about it, Sean. Uh, sorry, through you, Chair, come back on that yeah. point. I mean... Whilst I'm not using this site as an example, I can give an example of similar situations where there's been a housing estate, there's been a number of applications that have been built and the remaining numbers or two or three plots haven't been completed. The Highway Authority, and again I'm, I'm speaking from my knowledge or interaction with the Highway Authority, not Derbyshire um, County Council, but just a Highway Authority, they will not adopt the road unless it's actually the base course and the final topping courses in. Now the developer and themselves will not do that until the sites are I mean, there might be a landscape, there might be a bit of um, um, turf to go down, some landscaping to go in, but it's substantially complete. At that point, that's when the point, the, 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 the clock will start ticking for the highway authority to adopt it or to ask the developer to make alterations to make it to an adoptable standard. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, is that, yeah. and if, uh, Councillor O'Brien, please. Thank you, Chair. I've got a... Uh, essentially a legal question here. Um, we know that this uh, 
dwelling the, which is the subject of this application is currently under construction. And therefore, it is, uh, is a breach of the planning law. If the application were approved, uh, we see that it is subject to a revision to the Section 106 agreement. Uh, and therefore, uh, any uh, approval this evening would not become valid until that Section 106 agreement were uh, made and signed. So in the period between uh, any possible approval this evening and that Section 106 agreement being signed and therefore the planning consent being issued, uh, is the Council content to allow the construction to continue? Sorry, uh, I can bring in the Council solicitor if, uh, Kerry, <laughs> would you like to try and respond? Do you want to take it? <laughs> if you want me to come in first then, yeah. Sean. Um, I mean, I work in, on instructions from the officers, but from what you've said, Councillor O'Brien, then, then you are correct that the planning permission, if you're minded to approve it, wouldn't be valid until the Section 106 is revised and signed. So the period between then and now, they're in a period of what you'd say would be a technical breach of uh, of planning law and would um you've got to kind of take it on its own merits would enforcement of that knowing that it's just a passage of time until it does get regularized would that be in the public interest to enforce at that time now that's a question that would go before the um you know those that take that decision but it would be my advice that would would that be um you know the best use of our time that it would, you know, it's only a matter of time before the Section 106 is, is revised, and that is within our gift to do. If they don't sign it, then of course, then they are within breach, and then yes, it would be, we would be in a different situation. But I think giving them time to, you know, reasonable amount of time to go through that process of variation would be would be reasonable. And I would, but I would suggest that those in the locality to, to see what, what is currently happening whilst that remains unsigned. Councillor O'Brien. Could, could, I, could I pull it? What, what would you no. consider a reasonable amount of time between any granting of permission and the signing of a 106? Well, the, uh, the amount of reasonableness is always about the man on the Clapham omnibus and what he deems as being reasonable. And... Um, I'm not going to say a uh, you know a, a, an actual time date, but if you're asking me personally, what I would you know give to be a reasonable amount of time would be a week, month, six weeks. You know, and if they don't come back within that time, then the, you know then then so it's so not time time. to complete the construction. No, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, sorry, to you, Chair, and uh, just to pick up on that point uh, for Councillor Bryan. Um, there are a number of authorities out there that have very similar situations have to wrestle with this problem, the committees. When the application is, as per the recommendation of this, to defer pending the completion of that section 106, what some authorities do do is put a time limit on that. So basically put, say, I don't know, a month, two months, on the application that if it's not signed and sealed within that period, it's referred back to members, members are updated on the situation, and then the outcome of that recommendation may well differ what's been proposed, i.e. to support the application. My experience of that, of two or three authorities, that does tend to clarify minds in terms of progressing the 106 and getting that to a point where it can be signed, sealed, and then decision issued. That may be something members may well wish to consider in this instance. Thank you. Call upon the Vice Chairman, please, Councillor Burfoot. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, could I refer to, it is a question, could I refer to page 35 and uh, 7.4 when concerns been raised about the hedges that have been removed? Um, I notice in 7.5 we say that um, planting a hedge to seek to soften the view is, is considered unnecessary, albeit if the applicant were to propose uh, to provide such, this would also be deemed acceptable. If this committee was minded to approve this application tonight, could could we not con condition that as part of a, a planting scheme? 
Sean. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Were members too minded to um, support the application, then yes, a condition of that nature could be added to the decision. <coughs> I just go back if I may, Chair. Um, so, it does say in the report that there's not really <coughs> enough room to do it. So, how could that work? Uh, for you, Chair, if I may. We can ask for a, an appropriate landscaping scheme to be submitted, and obviously, we'll have to assess that on the ground. It may well be, quite frankly, token gestures that we achieve or secure on the site, but we can secure a level of planting on there and its retention thereafter. But it won't be, um, given the constraints on the actual plot itself, it won't be a substantive or large amount of planting, but something could help, could assist to soften that, and that could be conditioned appropriately, i.e. a landscaping condition. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Boothroyd. Could I ask a question that might be a suggestion to that problem? Yeah. This seems to be, it was previously put in as a five-bedroom property with detached garage, and now is a three-bedroom property with detached garage and as far as i can tell is the only property where they've still got a detached garage all other properties have a shed type thing which is stone built but they've all been built with that could we condition that actually there is no garage associated with this property which opens up a bit of space for a hedge uh, Sean, yes sir, yeah. thank, thank you through you chair <coughs> Because this is part retros um, retrospective application, well, this is ret retrospective application, we would have to refuse this application. It's what we've got in front of us this evening. And then we would obviously enter into negotiations to actually try and secure that. But it would have to be the refusal of this permission in front of members this evening. The garage hadn't started to be built. Is it the whole thing? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Boothroyd. We have a motion before, no, a recommendation, sorry, members, before us that uh, approval is granted. Over to you, uh, Councillor Whitehead. I would like to not kind of uh, follow the recommendation. I'd like to ask for a deferment. There seems to be so many unanswered questions um, in this application, which should be a really straightforward application, but yet we've, we've, we've picked it apart in about five minutes. So I would suggest maybe a deferment and maybe they can come back with some better clarity for us. Councillor Slack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd support a deferral uh, because we can uh, clarify a lot to, uh, in the deferral. Uh, I'm not happy with certain issues. Uh, the uh, garage is, is one of them and uh, the ch changing of the uh, from a three bedroom, from a five bedroom down to three bedroom. Uh, we need to get clarity on this and we need to defer it and, and uh, discuss it again with the developer. Can I test then? We've got a motion before us for deferral. All those in favour? Uh, ag against? Abstentions? So, um, the deferral is um, carried. carried. That's the substantive motion. Uh, Councillor Peter Dobbs, and I do apologise, I did cut you short. That's okay. It's just, I, I, don't we need to specify the precise answers that we want from the deferral? <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to uh, um, be here again. Sorry, Councillor, yeah. just uh, I can come back on that one, Chair, if I may. Yeah. The point I picked up on was the to defer basically for just to beef up the rationale as to why. It's changed from five, a five-bedroom property to a three-bedroom property, and the consideration or to enter into discussion with the actual developer for the deletion or looking at the parking arrangement to possibly even delete it to, to accommodate additional landscaping on the site, on the plot. Uh, Councillor O'Brien. Uh, yeah, consequent on that um, decision, could, could I ask what is the position then with the continued construction of the dwelling. What is the council's position having deferred something which is being built without planning consent? Sorry, through you, Chair. I can come back on that point. I mean, basically, we can certainly make the developer aware of this. We would have to consider what enforcement action, if any, is required. I mean, obviously, the, the, the test for a stop notice or a temporary stop notice is incredibly high. Will this breach that? I seriously doubt that. But we would strongly suggest to the developer that they should cease until this is resolved. 
and anything that they are doing or continue to do on the site is entirely at their own risk and may be subject to where the application not to be supported, where to be refused, that will be then go to an appeal, possibly an enforcement action. It may result in the removal of the actual dwelling. That's worst case scenario, but all of these are at risk. The risk element that the developer will have to consider on way in the round. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Archer and then Councillor Whitehead. Uh, just to clarify, I was, I was not against the idea of a deferral. I, was, I thought normally once there's been a proposal deferral, there would have been debate before we voted. And, but I'm, so I don't think there, were, there was debate. I think we went straight from the proposal to the vote. And I wouldn't, I'm just raising that now in case that's a point of order that might make that vote not valid. So I just want to double check we've not shot ourselves in the foot by voting before we debate, before we'd had an opportunity to debate, if that makes sense. I was testing the feeling of the meeting, which seemed to indicate, Rob, that it was preferable to go to a different uh, motion before, before members. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's Kerry. Thank you. Just to come in on that point. Um, yeah, I mean, the members voted um, and they are within their rights to vote on things that they have enough information on to, uh, to cast that vote. So, but just whilst I've got the uh, whilst I've got oh. the speaker on, I just wanted to come back on the incorporate, you know, the enforcement matter. And um, the Derbyshire Dales District Council does have a corporate enforcement policy, and if ever if members are minded to go and have a look at that, or any member of the public, it does detail what in what circumstances the uh, the District Council does take enforcement action, not just in planning, but in any regulatory authority that uh, the District Council contains. So it does. It is quite a. Uh, uh, you know, a, a big policy on what we do take into account. Uh, Councillor Dobbs, you, OK. We, we took the vote. Uh, sorry, Councillor Whitehead. And, was, and then that... I'd like to conclude uh, after your comments. Please. Yeah, it was only just on the clarity that we're seeking. Are we still? Are we not also seeking clarity about Section 106 in terms of the imp how this changes the impact on that? This gives us a chance to sort that out. Um, and then... I'll come back to the road again. Is there any re any assurances that we can have, uh, which will hopefully assure the parish council as well, that this that the, kind of this, that the developer does have plans uh, for the road? Um, sure. Through you, Chair, if I can come back on that one point that was mentioned there um, about the 106. I mean, the fact is the this being one of the wider number of sites. This was the, the partial contribution that this site or the amount that would have been equated or portion equated to this development was worked out on a five bedroom property. This is now proposed as a three bedroom property. So it is likely that as part of the actual 106, that there may be a slight revision in that. We're not talking substantial amounts, but there will be a revision in that. I'd like then to members turn now to page 39 of the agenda. Uh, this is in Councillor Whitehead's ward. It's the um, 80 Cromford Hill, Cromford, pertaining to the impact that the unauthorised roof lights have had on the special character and appearance of this Grade 2 listed building. And the officer recommendation is listed building consent be refused. Um, I'm not sure, have we got any speak? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I do apologise. Mr Newbury, you've um, three minutes to address the committee, please. Is, is the agent, is it? So, sorry, I do apologise. You, you have five minutes. Yep. Thank you for the opportunity to speak um, this evening. Hopefully I won't be five minutes. Uh, um, I moved into the home uh, at the end of 2022 on buying this house. I decided I want to put energy and resources into my home to replace a, mid, a very dated mid-1980s bathroom, which was pictured in the design and access statement. And that was while my life was settling down. As part of this work, I inserted the two roof lights to give more light and ventilation to this dark space, but also to increase the very limited headroom. This enabled a full length bath as well, instead of the short one, and there was and also enabled me to put a shower where I could stand under it um, as a shower head, not pictured, was able to utilise the space of that roof light. Part of the works also upgraded the boiler to be more energy efficient, to replace the existing hot water system, and also to mean that the 
water that was there only gave three minutes worth of shower. Um, and also by putting the full bath in, uh, it meant I could also treat the eczema that I have. Um, this work was all started February 23, completed in March 2023. I was aware that the house was listed, but was under the strong impression um, that how the original 1760s house looks on Cromford Hill should be preserved at the front. The previous occupier had made me aware that the front door was painted in the correct colour and made the correct timber to be in keeping for the listing for the street scene of the hill. The rear roof where the roof lights have been added is a late addition, mid 19th century, and in fact the roof covering and rafters were fully replaced in 1985. So I presumed we're not listed and just didn't think about needing to apply. Um, when you look at the original application, you'll see that the sister house, as I call it, which is downhill from me, um, is also mentioned the listing. It already has roof lights in, which you, you see um, sort of from the bathroom. Uh, so I mistakenly just thought that having those roof lights inserted just didn't need permission to be thought for. Um, as Derbyshire Dales, you wrote to me um, in June, and I rang straight away to try and resolve this. Part of the discussion at the time was that somebody had raised the fact that the limestone pitchings out the front of my house uh, were being taken up by me, but in actual fact, I was bedding them back down, having taken up a decade worth of weeds. So I am very much mindful of the property I've got and how it should be. Um, and also, as soon as I'd writ uh, written, I contacted Councillor Whitehead, as you mentioned, and asked him to come and visit to see what benefit I'd been doing to the property so that he could come and have a look at that um, and uh, work on a way forward with me. It is mentioned, I acknowledge in um, the consultee response that the conservation officer says that there's a detrimental effect um, on that, on the property. I can't. I can't agree with that opinion because obviously I'm, I'm wanting to, to have that. I've also spoken to my neighbours, 78 and 82, and also to 84, whose garden wraps around the property. All of these had no issue when the work was being done, and of all, were quite surprised when a site notice went up that I was, well, what are you applying for? I said, well, it's the work that's been done. All of them have been very supportive and all say, well, we, we we wouldn't want to object. Um, I know they're not here to, to say that. That's just uh, me saying that. But they are very pleased that I've been working on the house, improving it, making it better. I am aware that there is an older footpath around the back that these can perhaps be seen from. Um, I would say that it's hard to glimpse them. Uh, what the, that particular picture doesn't show is that when you do look down the street over the rooftops, you actually see a tremendous amount of plastic windows and satellite dishes and various other things that are far more modern additions um, that are far more noticeable. Yes, people have put the satellite dishes on the back of the house. That's great. Um, you know, but that's what you do see when you're looking down there when you, you read the comments about the, the rear of the properties. So, yes, I, I understand some harm has been done to the property, but I trust that with all the work that I've done, I've benefited the property as well with the other work and so I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak and and take let the committee um, consider. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Newbury. Yep. Uh, can I bring in Sean? Thank you. Stan, thank you, Jeff. Can I just take members through if we go back to the beginning of the presentation, just so effectively this application proposed to seek or seeks retrospective application for the retention of two unauthorised roof lights that have been installed, installed to the roof, rear roof space. In terms of assessing this, it's the, what constitutes substantial harm? And this is a listed building, as we mentioned. The Conservation Officer has objected to that based on the actual impact on the listed building itself. And it's what is or what does cause substantial harm to a heritage, heritage asset? And how that weighs in the balance. I mean, the main issue here is that we've got unauthorised developments, or unauthorised roof lights, sorry, have been installed to a special character in this Grade 2 list, to this Grade 2 listed building. The National Planning Policy Guidance, or the NPPG, advises local governments to consider the implications of cumulative change and change to heritage assets. And it's the identified harm that needs to be assessed and weighed in the balance. And yes, there may well be other more modern additions to some of the buildings within the actual area itself. 
and forgive me, I haven't actually got a list of what those properties are, but those themselves may not be listed. This building is. And so obviously we have to need to consider that and what adverse impact that will have on the actual building itself and whether or not it either preserves or enhances the actual building itself. And on balance, officers, conservation officer and the case officer, do not consider that it either preserves or enhances the list of building. Therefore, the recommend the application from the members is to uh, refuse the application. Thank you Thank for you, that uh, outline, Sean. First of all, Councillor Archer, then Councillor Lees and Councillor Whitehead. Uh, thank, thanks, Chair. My question is really ab about precedent. Because um, having talked earlier about being uh, suspicious of retrospective applications, I don't think there's the same case here. I think there's a different reason for this being retros retrospective. So just to put that on the record. Well, the question is about precedent. Um, because I have some sympathy here with this applicant, but I also have a lot of sympathy with the officers as well, in terms of this being a list of buildings. So I'm, I'm really torn on this one at the moment. And if we were minded to allow it to, to remain, are we in danger then of weakening our ability to protect listed buildings going forward because we've set a precedent um, in terms of allowing this one? Can you respond to that question, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, through you. Um, in short, yes, it is difficult. Precedent itself is, again, it's down to fact and degree. But obviously, once you've allowed one, it makes it more difficult to allow or retain others as you move along in the fact that, that actually the special nature or character of that building has been diminished by such. And so therefore, to go back to your question, councillor, it is difficult to actually try and defend or ward off other applications of, the, of, of nature's or unauthorised buildings, unauthorised, sorry, works to listed buildings. Councillor Lees. Thank you, Chair. Um, do we actually know when, when the building was listed? As, you know, because, uh, noted that, uh, well, the applicant uh, briefly mentioned about the, uh, the front of the property has got concrete roof tiles on, so to me that's quite, quite a... An addition at the time, so yes, on page four, it is nineteen ninety. It was actually listed, and paragraph seven point two. Right, so the, so the, the 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 roofing on the front elevation was done before the listing, then basically. I don't have any information to confirm that, councillor. I can never give. Uh, councillor Whitehead, please. Hey, Sean. Um, so precedent. I'm, I'm going to go on it uh, again. So if the picture that we've got up now, if we just tilted that a little bit to the left and we'd see the next door's property, what do you think you'd see on that roof of a Lux window? That's also a listed property. So we've set a precedent already because we've not taken any enforcement action on that property, I don't believe. I'm sure you'll let me know if we have. Also, when I went to Mr. Newbury's property and had a look around. I think he's doing it very sympathetically, but I'll talk about that in debate. I decided to go and have a walk at Cromford Hill because the whole area is a conservation zone. So surely no one should be putting the Lux windows in without any kind of support from the planning officers to do that. I counted nine just on my quick walk. That's on front facing. So that's front, the front of the conservation zone on the buildings. So uh, God knows how many are on the back where Mr. Newbury's put his. So I'm, I'm really puzzled that kind of we've taken, why have we taken a stand against this resident, but we've let it go for years and years and years. And the Lex windows are not that old, really, are they? Most of them, it's quite a modern thing. So I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit puzzled about your refusal. So I just wonder whether you could just tell me a little bit more about precedent. Well, um, through your chair for my, I mean, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I mean, the, if the work, if works have been carried out to a listed building and they need a listed building consent, then there is no immunity period. So we will investigate those buildings that you've mentioned and the site, and then themselves could be liable to prosecution for unauthorised works. So we will, we can actually look at that as, uh, as an authority moving forward. I don't want you to do that. I am the local councillor. That's not something I'm asking you to do. I'm just saying that we've already set the precedent. So does precedent not mean anything in planning decisions? I thought precedent counted quite a lot because I've sat in these meetings for about a year now and we get told about precedent all the time and we've overturned countless decisions on that basis. So I'm really puzzled. Yes, through you, Chair, for me. Yeah. 
You're right, yes. The president would be there were those works to be lawful. And if they are to list a building that needs consent and it still hasn't had consent or regularised, then that in itself would not create a precedent. That would not be justification enough to allow other property to come forward. If then that property itself, the neighbouring properties you mentioned, or others, if they've got unauthorised works to those, that in themselves, I mean, there is no immunity period for a listed building. So if, it's to, if, it's, if it predates the listing, then it's listed as the building itself, and they may well have replaced those Veluxes themselves, or updated them. However, if it actually, if they were installed after that period, and those properties themselves are listed, then that is something that is, is unlawful, basically, and there's no immunity period, as there are, are with other forms of development to residential properties. A final question, uh, Can we not, I mean, again, we've, we've spoken about this a lot of times in planning, but do we not need our, the homes that we live in to be fit for purpose for modern living? It's no good living in a house that was designed 200 years ago. Because we'd be living with no electricity, no plumbing, no a, a kind, of, kind of terrible insulation. So I don't, I kind of, it's a really, and I get there's a really delicate balance that we have to draw. But I think when something's been done as sympathetically as this, I think this is where our planning officers need to sort of have a think about not just it's a listed building, but actually what makes it a livable building. I'd, I'd like to conclude at that point. Well, I think a lot of us have sympathy with what you're saying, Councillor Whitehead. Please, members, this is supposed to be, you know, crisp questions, please. So, Councillor Buttle. I'll try and be crisp. <laughs> I used to have windows like this in my previous house and I loved them and they were great. And the question is, on, my ne on the next house I came along, I just decided to go with conservation windows, which were a tenth of the size and were grey and small and not particularly intrusive. And the line of the glass was pretty much in the same line as the plane of the roof. Would we have taken a different line with Mr. Newbury, who's, you know, I, he, he made his choices and I've, you know, I've, he's welcome to make them. Would we have taken a different line if he'd chosen a couple of small conservation windows that were, say, 18 inches by two foot? Uh, yes, sir, through you, Chair. It's difficult to answer that one, Councillor. Um, however, you're quite right, there are products on the market, the conservation windows, build, uh, windows that are accepted by a lot of conservation officers throughout various authorities, roof lights being one of those, replacement windows being one of those, and there are some modern materials, um, PVC windows that are accepted in listed buildings, subject to the grade of the listed building, but it's, it, it's, it's constructed in a certain way with certain materials, and what you mentioned there, a conservation roof light is smaller than what's been shown there, it is sunk, and it is, tends to be a colour match to the roofing material of the actual parent property, so whether it's a, a, clay, a clay tile or whether it's a slate or concrete tile. So th there are colour matches you can do, but that in itself is a quite particular bespoke product, and it has got a conservation light. So whilst I can't answer that, obviously where an application put in front of officers, we will assess an application for a conservation um, light or roof light to a listed building or in a conservation area where PD rights have been removed for such additions. Thank you, Chair. So, Burford. Thank you, Chair. Um, if the, can I ask the officer, if, if the committee were minded to refuse this application, um, what, I hope you don't think this is an obvious question, but um, what would we actually ask the applicant to do um, I'm just thinking what we would be left with um, in terms of him removing them. What, what, what would we then ask him to do with, with that gap, if you like? And if he wanted to come back with conservation windows that we may or may not approve, he'd have to come back with a, another application, would he? I'm just, I'm just kind of mulling over in my mind if we refuse it, we ask him to literally take them out. What does what would he replace the, the hole with? 
Chief uh, Councillor, and through you, Chair. <coughs> It's difficult for me to comment on that in terms of what shape or what the enforcement instruction would be or the instruction from the authority would be to the actual the, the applicant. I mean, in theory, whether to engage with, whether to be refused, there is an opportunity for the applicant to engage with the authority and look at alternatives. Yeah. We will then ask the conservation officer to assess that. Yeah. We can then look at that and it may well be that a solution can be found that would be still allow lighting to go in there, but it would look in a different guise to what's been what's shown on the photographs or what's in the building as it stands. Thank you. Councillor Boothroyd. I just want to ask a question about the identified harm. Um, is it related to specifically the building or is it the surrounding area and community? Because if we're essentially identifying harm that is linked to a community, then by leaving a essentially a room sort of unusable to the person who's who's bought the property by he's a tall man I've, i think I've, I've noticed and like so the life has moved on and everyone has got taller and one of the reasons he's put these in is to essentially make that room a little bit higher for himself is there otherwise i mean but my question really is because where we have this number of listed buildings and this number of heritage properties in our district by restricting them to being more difficult to live in, are we encouraging it that it's more for temporary, holiday-type accommodation and really making it more difficult? I live in a heritage, not heritage, in a conservation area with conservation windows with permanent black mould because of a planning issue. That, if my little boy was sickly, we would move. If he had asthma, we would have to move, and therefore that property essentially becomes unlivable for a young family. I guess my question is about that inherent harm. Is it, sorry, identified harm? Is it just to the building? Sean. Mm. Yep. Yes, yeah, sorry, Chair, if I can come back. It is to the building and the area. But however, I mean, whilst I do empathise with what you've said, and I do empathise with the situation of the applicant here, recommendations from in front of members to weigh in the balance. I mean, members may well choose to come to a different conclusion than what's been presented in front of or well, as part of the report this evening. But obviously there is the present element to be wrestled with and what harm that could create penultimately uh, were we to get to a point where we're on our 200th non-conservation um, area roof light going in the building. And some of the conservation roof lights now, more modern ones, have got um, better materials in them that can stop drafts and do, do, do stop drafts and that are more easy to maintain. Again, I'm speculating on, on, on that point. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to take as a final... No, sorry, there's going to be at least another three then. It's Councillor Slack, Councillor Lees and then Councillor O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Chair. Could we clarify, uh, there's a lot of debate about this area, some of it's conservation, some of it's not. Can we clarify how much uh, there is conservation... Uh, there's some buildings in this area. I mean, we, we had to puzzle, aren't we? If you've got a list of buildings, then one outside of what's not listed, it's very complicated, isn't it, really? Usually, listed buildings are running parallel to one another, don't they, really? But can we clarify this? Is he, do we have that information? Yeah, sure. Sorry, Chair, if, if I could. I, I don't have that information to hand. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, there is the National Register of listed buildings that would be can call up. There, there tends to be... Well, there can be a number of parent properties or if it's a row of terrace, the terrace itself could be listed. Yeah. However, that said, mm. I have seen situations where there's been a row of terraces, for example, where there's only been, say, two out of the five that have been listed because they're still, at the time of listing, they're still true to the original form of the built property. So it, yeah. it doesn't always go in hand in hand that parent pro mm. adjacent properties are listed. Yeah. But more often than not, it tends to be the case. Very confusing, isn't it, to mm. yes. people in that area? What if the house is listed or not? Yeah, so thank Councillor you. Councillor Lee, information. Can, can I have your question, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's just a pity we didn't have a site visit here, to be to be honest. Could you just confirm if that the window on the gable end is part of the same room? No, it's not. No, room. It, it's the, yeah, it, it's it, it's. Um, with me, it's covered in point seven point one two. Yeah, so it's a different room. Right, thank you, thank you, Councillor. Councillor O'Brien. 
Uh, sorry, Chair, I don't have a question. I wanted to right. speak in debate. Right, that's fine. Um, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll go into debate then, please. We have a officer recommendation for refusal. Uh, Councillor Whitehead. Uh, so, yeah, obviously, I called it in. So, I'm, I'm going to be asking the committee to go against officer recommendation. I'd like committee to approve this application. I'm to approve it, kind of, not because I want to see damage to heritage properties, but I do want to see properties that people can live in, that they can kind of, that they do it in a sympathetic way, in a careful, considerate way to kind of the property. And I think Mr. Newbury has done that. He, he invited me into his house. Not only did he show me uh, the windows in question, both from the outside and the inside, he also took the opportunity to show me the work he's been doing across the whole of the house. He's going to be a fine custodian for this property. When he took over it, it was in a poor state of repair. And already, even after a very short time of living there, he's made a big difference. I find it incredible that we've got properties all along the same road. And I, I, I get what Sean says about kind of in these sort of cases, precedent doesn't always kind of add up to the same. But we want people to live in these houses. We can't just be creating little museums kind of that people just aren't fit for purpose anymore. So I would hope that we can support Mr. Newbury in his, in his kind, of, kind of to bring in this whole property up to spec and allowing him to have some decent living standards in his bathroom. So I propose this. Been moved. And Councillor Bryan, are you seconding? No. Does it find a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Boothroyd. It's open for the debate then. Members, Councillor Archer and then Councillor O'Brien. Councillor um, Archer. I feel, feel, I feel bad about this, what I'm about to say, but I feel I have to disagree with, with the motion. Um, when I look at a retrospective application such as this, I have a lot of sympathy with this applicant. I really do. I think I agree with what Councillor White has said about where he's coming from and wanting to be a good custodian of the property. However... I have to ask the question, if this had been brought to us as a request for permission, I'm fairly sure we'd have said no, and we'd have said you need to work with the officers to come up with a, at least a more sympathetic way of doing this. Um, and that, on that basis, I'm very nervous to then say yes to something that's retrospective, because that will potentially encourage other people to do the work and then come back to us and say, oh, are we all right with this? rather than coming and saying, can we work with you to make sure we do this in the right way for the conservation area and for the list of building, which is how it should have happened. And I completely accept that the applicant did not intend it this way. I'm not wanting to criticise the applicant personally for this. But in terms of a, a planning decision, if we say yes to this, my worry is we're encouraging other people who may not be as, as um, honest and upfront as, as the applicant to do what work they want to do and then come back because they think they've got a better chance of us then approving it than if it comes to us in the first place. And on that basis, reluctantly, um, I would have to go with um, officer recommendation rather than the motion that's been proposed on this one. This application is almost becoming like an episode of the Moral Maze. Uh, Councillor uh, O'Brien, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, I have to agree entirely with uh, Councillor Archer. Um, I think we do need to support our officers uh, on this occasion um, because I think as been pointed out we are uh, the guardians of, our, of the heritage in the district and in Cromford. Uh, we designated the conservation area. Uh, this property was listed and we, in, we are entrusted with the, as I said, the guardianship of, of that listing. Um, and uh, there is a precedent. I think if you look at uh, if you look at the design which uh, the proposal is asking us to accept, um, I, I would challenge anyone to say that that uh, in the insertion of uh, roof lights to that design are appropriate to the the character of that of that dwelling, and I, and I don't think that that is actually what the proposer is suggesting. I think the proposer is suggesting that we um, approve the application for for other reasons, uh, which 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 I don't um, 
which he's perfectly entitled to do. But th there would be a precedent here. And I, what, what, I, what I would say is that um, it is absolutely correct that there are alternative um, solutions to bring light into uh, this sort of uh, room, an, an upstairs room within the roof space, uh, alternative um, solutions to that uh, which do not involve um, the roof lights that you see on the screen uh, in front of us. Uh, and I, I think, um, unfortunate though it is uh, for the applicant, uh, he or she would be able to um, be able to source th those alternatives, negotiate a, a scheme with our officers to, to uh, the mutual satisfaction. And, and, and therefore, I, I, I think I conclude by saying um, we are the guardians of our heritage. And that's a responsibility which we must take seriously. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Whitehead, you can wind up. I've, I've got a list. Um, so you'll have the final say. Uh, Councillor Dobbs, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I did manage a quick site visit on the way here, and it's perfectly true. It's not exactly in your face. You get a glimpse from this very narrow and probably not very often used uh, footpath looking across. It's much lower than you think it's going to be as well, um, so less obtrusive for that reason. But, and it's a big but, there are two of them. I just don't quite see why this big splash of modern on that uh, roof was uh, thought to be appropriate. And so I am with the officer recommendation on this. And bec uh, uh, not least because we're not making it unlivable in. There are alternatives that have been suggested. And I think um, uh, the owner will ensure that he does look after this wonderful property. Uh, but this was unfortunate, a misstep, but one which can be remedied. And I'm with officer recommendations on this one. Thank you, Gil. Councillor Burford. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think this is a really difficult one to make a decision on. But I'm going on the side of officer's recommendation on this one for the reasons that have been given by colleagues on that side. I do have sympathy with, with the applicant, but it is unfortunate that it, it is a retrospective application. I'd like to think that if we do go for officer recommendation of refusal, that we, I may be wrong on this, that we, we, could, we could not take enforcement action and allow the applicant time to come to the officers with an alternative that that is appropriate in terms of conservation windows that you've talked about so that's my take on it um i really don't know whether that's possible but i'd like to think that we do give the applicant a chance to um to come up with with the agreement of the officer some kind of solution to what is a really difficult problem and, it, and it's a difficult decision for us to take. But on balance, I think the officers have got it right on this one. Thank you, Sue. Councillor Boothroyd? No? Uh, then it's Councillor Slack. Peter, please. Thank you, David. Uh, I do uh, agree with Sue very much so. Um, a few weeks ago, we, uh, we uh, approved uh, uh, solar panels on a list of building at the Dale in Wordsworth. And uh, the, the, all the roof was solar panel. And uh, really, uh, we, the officer recommended was for refusal. But we took it nowadays that uh, uh, climate change is, is, a, is a very important and it's more important sometimes than heritage. And uh, we need to do this for, for the planet, of course. But um, we made a, we, did we make a precedent there by doing that? Or, or uh, are solar panels completely different to uh, uh, window lights? That's one of my questions. And also, I agree with Councillor Burford that we not uh, we do try and look at some at, uh, which is more conservation windows, if yeah, and, and maybe have to replace these. And but uh, rather than uh, having to take this space away from the gentleman, we can. Uh, try and let some light in somewhere. 
Can so, I, Chair, thank you. Can I uh, use my privileged position here, sitting at the front table, to to ask um, Sean whether that what I've said is possible before we take the vote? Yes, uh, through you, Chair. Um, so the the question I believe was where it to be refused, where to be voted on and refused as per the officer recommendation is whether or not we could enter into a discussion with the applicant to look at an alternative mm -hmm. and try and agree an alternative mm -hmm. on the site mm -hmm. before we go down the yeah. enforcement route. I mean, that's something we could invite the applicant to do, yes. I mean, obviously, we'd, it may well be we can secure something appropriately, mm -hmm. but obviously it's, it's to what we can recommend as to whether or not, I mean, this may not fit the requirement of the applicant. So we may be mm -hmm. faced with a situ difficult situation. We can certainly have those discussions mm. and certainly speak to the conservation officer or the conservation advice conservation advice on that basis so dare i come back chair and say would there be a time limit on that too for the applicant to come to some arrangement before any <coughs> enforcement was taken to remove what's there certainly we can agree or set down a time frame when we must agree something and then that will be have to be subject to a new application to consider that but that's certainly something we can do so, councillor buttle i'm very pleased to see that this is going the way i wanted it to go which is uh, for a refusal um i don't think they're even slightly appropriate um, I'm quite concerned about the fact that we've got a sash window that's actually hard up against the face of the uh, gable end. You know, like sash windows really should be set back. So, like that, that would be something I would I'd encourage the enforcement uh, officers to have a look at too. It's a world heritage, world heritage site. This, you know, like it's actually quite an important thing, Cromford in the world it's just not a little old place with a few old cottages somewhere we should be caring about so yeah definitely supporting the officers on this one i'm going to invite now the ward member councillor whitehead if you'd kindly wind wind the debate up please and then we'll test the motion thanks chair uh so yeah kind of as i've already said i think mr newbury kind of acted in complete good faith he didn't didn't i kind of know he needed planning permission for these windows based on the precedent of many other properties on Cromford Hill. Um, so you can understand why I didn't think it was necessary. So I think we can we can overlook kind of that mistake and sort of try and judge it on kind of what we see before us. I think it's a sympathetic sort of development. I'm surprised a site visit, because Neil's just made a comment there, but I don't think you can appreciate it from this photograph at all. Uh, and the fact that you've not been on a site visit, Neil, and the committee weren't taken on a site visit, I'm a, I'm a, it's a bit, a bit of a strain. It literally would have took you two minutes uh, and you would have got a much better appreciation for it. Um, but yeah, I kind of... I think the only other thing that disappoints me about some of the comments that I've heard today is that we seem to be pick and choosing the heritage buildings that we want to sort of protect because we, I've sat in many, many meetings over the past sort of nine, ten months where we've quite happily overturned, for various reasons, uh, officers' decisions based on uh, grade, at least one grade two uh, listed building. I can't remember if the Ashbourne Hall one was also a grade two listed building. And we made we allowed significant change and alteration to that property, uh, even moving windows and moving doors and allowing an extension to go on it. So I think we, as a committee, we should be very careful uh, in terms of kind of where we where we set our standards and we should have a little bit of consistency in terms of our decision making but as i said i think this is sympathetic i think if we if if we go with officers recommendations and refuse this then it kind of it's obviously going to incur mr newbury kind of quite high costs in either kind of repairing it or replacing it with you no know, doubt incredibly expensive windows he's already paid for these windows so I would also ask committee members just to balance that sort of personal sort of aspect into their sort of decision making tonight. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. We've had a very fair open debate. So I'd like to test whether or not we refuse. Um, but uh, the motion before us is to uh, accept uh, the two windows. All those in favour of the motion, please David, show. So, so, 
Uh, I'm sorry, David, I think you got that upside down. It was Nick off. Nick moved to... For, for, for con, for, oh, well, for, I'm getting it upside down, down then. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. The sweets will still come round, Neil, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> So, members, all those that are in favour of the motion before us that Councillor Whitehead has ward member move, please show. That's one, two. Against. One, two, three, four, five, six. So, that is well and truly defeated. Now I need someone, please, to move. Councillor O'Brien, does that find a seconder, please? Councillor Buttle, would you like to... That's right. Right, Okay. Yeah. Could I move the recommendation with the addition of a note to applicant um, in respect of uh, a period of negotiation to find an alternative and hopefully acceptable solution? And the second of Councillor Buttle. I very much support that. I don't think we need to be becoming, being heavy-handed with this. We just need to look after our heritage. And it's about the whole thing it's not just about what you can see it's the precedent as well that matters the motion is open to debate councillor boothroyd and then councillor whitehead just very quickly in terms of finding the acceptable solution they would then need to apply for planning permission for that acceptable solution and come back yeah yeah uh, councillor Whitehead. yeah it was just a point of order i didn't think you could condition a refusal you, Chair. It's not a condition, it's just a note to go on the actual, on the decision notice, you have notes on the bottom to applicants or agents. You can do that on a reason for refusal as well. Can we put this now then to the vote, please? All those in favour of the motion before you to uh, refuse. Against, what, two against, any abstentions and, and one abstention. So the motion is carried. Thank you. We turn then to the uh, fourth application, which is on page 45 of the agenda. This was a site visit. Um, thought it was an incredible site visit yesterday. It was a very interesting part of Kirk, uh, and it reminded me a bit of Winster, actually, uh, when we went on the higher level looking down on the ground. David, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. would it be possible just to have a five-minute comfort break? It, 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 would, would members... It, yes, please. Right. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll <laughs> re re-adjourn, uh, what, quarter to nine? Quite eight. Quarter to eight. <laughs> quarter, to eight. <laughs> quarter to eight. Right. Yeah, coffee time. Oh.
school house where we uh, had the site visit uh, yesterday and it pertains uh, a dwelling now somewhere on my list we have uh, a number of speakers please so can I first invite Mr Christopher Marsh Christopher um, you're a local resident and uh, you've got three minutes there's a button obviously for you to press as and when you want to commence hello great um, thank you um, and good evening to the members of the committee um, I'm a resident of Nether Lane um, and have been for over 18 years this application has received 35 objections in total and demonstrates the strength of feeling against this dwelling I wish to oppose this application on two key planning points and refer to the information sent to members earlier today point number one is impact on the designated principal view and the harm to the heritage asset the Kirk Ayrton conservation area appraisal identifies the most important and defining views within the heritage asset the view in between Netherfield Cottage and Wellcar the two properties opposite is classified as a principal long-range view which the appraisal states is one of the most important defining views which contributes towards the character and the appearance of this part of the conservation area additionally the Kirk Ayrton neighborhood plan states in policy p1 that development should pay particular attention to the conservation area appraisal and in policy p2 states that development should not be detrimental to views from the village or the heritage value of the landscape the principal view between the two properties down to the lake and beyond into the Ecclesbourne Valley is better experienced from the public right of way behind this dwelling um, as it looks looking across that proposed site where the dwelling is rather than glimpses of the view from Nether Lane uh, which are over the cars over sheds and other sort of garden paraphernalia the dwelling is placed directly in line of this view and when seen from the public right of way the view is actually pretty much blocked as the dwelling is far too tall and it's taller than the two properties opposite in question the parish council has objected to the development as it does not comply with policy p2 of the neighborhood plan the protection of views concerns were also expressed that there is no scale shown on the drawings which appear to show the building as too tall in summary on this point we consider that this dwelling does not satisfy the condition of the conservation area appraisal which has a requirement for any proposed development to conserve or enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area with the emphasis being on enhancement we therefore believe that it contravenes the conservation area appraisal and the Kirk Ayrton neighborhood plan and could set a precedent for the loss or significant impact of other principal views within the village of which there has just been a refusal um, close by that impacted another significant principal view but point number two is the increased flood risk to nether lane on the properties opposite the flooding of Nether Lane is becoming more frequent, causing flood water to enter Netherfield Cottage on three separate occasions into the kitchen and down into the lounge. This risk will be increased due to the additional surface water flowing onto Nether Lane from the non permeable surfaces associated with this dwelling. Mr. Marsh, you'll have to wind up now, please. Okay. Um, the scheme that they proposed has not been assessed by, by the council's qualified draining engineer. Um, it's unworkable and um, the flood risk report only assesses the risk to the new dwelling and not to the lane or the adjacent properties therefore we believe the requirement of policy pd8 flood risk management has not been met thank you very much indeed okay thank yeah. you very much thank you thank you for your time and then uh, zoe marsh please a local resident uh, and you're going to speak against the application as well yeah Sorry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and members yeah, of the committee. Yeah. 
If the committee were to vote in favour of this application, we politely request the following three conditions are put in place. Condition one, that the ridge height of the proposed dwelling is set lower than the ridge height of Netherfield Cottage and Well Car, whilst maintaining the same distance from Nether Lane as proposed in the plans. This would reduce the negative impact on the principal view. Condition two, a detailed flood risk report is approved by the council's qualified engineer before the work commences, which includes the increased risk during excavation of flood. Condition three, the applicant has offered a construction management plan. This should contain measures to ensure that no heavy duty excavation or construction vehicles park adjacent to Netherfield Cottage. The property we're talking about abuts Nether Lane with ground floor well below road level. The shallow foundations provide minimal support for the lane and for the property, resulting in the greatest risk of damage at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Hargreaves, please, another local resident, and you're going to comment on the application, please. Again, thank you, committee members, for allowing me the opportunity to raise my objections to the planning application. I've just raised a number of points. Firstly, I'm very concerned about the steepness of the site, which is a drop of over seven metres, and is in an area of natural springs with evidence of water seepage onto Nether Lane. The excavation required is substantial and creates a real risk of slippage to properties overlooking the site. But I note that there's been no geotechnical or hydrological survey that's been done. So what steps are proposed to prevent any slippage? And if problems are encountered, who will provide indemnity insurance to those properties? The second point is Kirkheim is, is classed as a tier four village in the Derbyshire Dales local plan with limited scope for the development due to the village infrastructure. In the past few years, approval has been given for at least six new properties in the village, with other applications currently being considered at appeal. This application should be considered in context with the other approved projects, as the vehicle simply cannot, sorry, the village cannot cope with more housing. The impact of traffic and large building lorries on the narrow lanes is already causing problems. The site also provides a key open space in the village, and the planning officer report in paragraph 7.5 states, this does act as a breathing space in this built up area of the village. This should be preserved for the benefit of the community and the local wildlife. Thirdly, the site location off Nether Lane is simply not suitable for development from a road safety perspective. There are no pavements to protect pedestrians and the proposal is already contravening the highways requirement for 25 meter visibility splays as vehicles regularly drive this road considerably faster than 10 miles an hour. This point, together with other considerations, should give plenty of reasons to reject the application. Fourthly, I'm concerned that the way regulations have been ignored in developing this site so far. Last year, the site was indiscriminately cleared, including cutting down a number of fruit and other trees which actually required prior permission, sorry, prior permission as the width of the trees was in excess of 75 millimetres. This was reported but seems to have been disregarded. This behaviour indicates the applicants are willing to ride roughshod over regulations in order to achieve the objectives. And if permission was to be granted, I would be very concerned they'll continue in the same vein. So would ask, if so, that um, can permitted development rights be removed to ensure compliance with any uh, proposals. Finally, I would say that if granted, this application could set a dangerous precedent for similar applications particularly where principal views are effective, and this will impact on the heritage of our, on our village. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you very much, Mr Hargraves. Um, I call upon now the agent, please, Miss Emily Weston, and you've got five minutes. Good evening, members. I am the agent speaking on behalf of Mr Blackwell in support of the planning application for one dwelling off Nether Lane. The proposal will deliver one dwelling with amenity space, access and parking. 
utilise a vacant area of land through infill and consolidation of the existing built framework of Kirk Item, provide high quality design respecting the heritage assets, retain the majority of the site as open land and deliver economic, social and environmental benefits. We have worked closely with officers and conservation advisors on the scheme and the high quality proposal ensures protection of the conservation area and nearby listed buildings. The proposal has support of the conservation officer, the highways authority, environmental health and Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, as well as the statutory consultees in relation to the footpath. Pre-application discussions took place with the local planning authority and the principle of development was found to be acceptable. Recommendations were suge suggested and addressed. A parish council meeting was attended and a leaflet sent out to locals providing the opportunity to make comments ahead of the planning application being formally submitted. Some concerns have been raised by local residents and the parish council. However, the changes to the dwelling have addressed these comments. The size of the dwelling has been reduced and set forward into the site, therefore maintaining the open character of the site. A flood risk assessment has been submitted which shows that surface water from the site can be controlled by attenuation. It will improve the current situation for Nether Lane, as currently water flows onto Nether Lane, whereas the proposed drainage will capture the surface water. Drainage detail details will be conditioned. The concerns regarding the principal views are not substantiated, and this is echoed within the officer's report. The dwelling is set into the bank, which means that from the footpath, there is a limited amount of the top of the dwelling visible. This is shown on the submitted visual that we've done from the footpath. Also, it is not within the area defined in the landscape sensitivity study as having high sensitivity. Instead, it is identified as within the settlement. In terms of the design, the proposed dwelling is well related to the existing pattern of development through the use of suitable materials, scale, massing, density and access. The proposal is a three-bedroom dwelling incorporating stone with traditional clay tile roofing and a chimney. Parking is off-road and the current stone walling and hedgerows have been retained and enhanced. The design reflects the site's context which is predominantly stone gabled roof properties that step down in height from west to east. There will be no adverse impacts on amenity or highways. Sufficient separation distances can be achieved with 11.45 from the ridge of Netherfield Cottage to the proposed dwelling ridge, as well as 11 metres from Wellcar to the proposed dwelling. From the eaves of the bungalow to the north to the eave of the proposed dwelling is 12 metres. These are sufficient distances with no adverse impacts on outlook or privacy. In terms of highways, there are no objections and sufficient parking and visibility can be achieved. The local planning authority cannot currently show a five-year housing land supply Therefore, it would contribute to housing need whilst fully in accordance with local and national planning policy, including the neighbourhood plan of Kirk Item. We have worked with an ecologist and biodiversity mitigation and enhancements are proposed. There will be integrated bat boxes as well as integrated swift boxes. Also, there will be wildflower planting and tree planting using British native trees as well as fruit trees. This meets the required environmental policies the request from Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and increases the environmental benefits on the site. The landscaping is shown on the submitted plans, however these will also be conditioned. In conclusion, the proposal is appropriate development. The scale and function of the dwelling is suitable to the settlement, utilising a vacant area of land that is not allocated as open space. Particular consideration has been given to heritage assets, providing high quality design and environmental benefits through landscaping, as well as incorporating energy efficient measures through the utilisation of EV charging points and an air source heat pump. In line with your officer's recommendation, I urge you to support this proposal and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you to all the contributors. Um, so, Sarah, you're the case officer for this, please. 
There are late reps to read, so if you want to... Read right, if members would just like to turn, there are some late uh, representations we need to look at. Members okay? Right, uh, Sarah, please. We stood on another lane and we went up and um, stood above on the footpath and looked over the site. Um, so it's one two-storey dwelling is proposed. Um, it's going to be a stone dwelling set within the bank. Um, that's the site plan there. Um, existing and wa walls and hedging would be retained and then the parking area um, to the north. There's um, a principal, there's considered to be a principal um, for a dwelling in this location as it constitutes appropriate infill and consolidation of the settlement. The conservation um, area appraisal doesn't include it as an open space within the village. However, um, obviously we consider that the open nature of the site has been retained um, in the retention of the garden area and position of the property. Um, and this is obviously, um, you know, um, that's a consideration and the conservation officer is, 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 um, finds that acceptable. Um, on to the sectional drawings, which um, aren't as clear as I'd like them to be, but there are um, ridge levels of the houses that surround it. Um, there's also a 3D visual, if I go through. Um, there's one proposed um, side elevation there where you can see that it's set into the bank and the lines above show the lines of the footpath and the, the height of the wall above. So really the height of the, the height of the, the floor level of the footpath is, is similar to the ridge height of the, of the actual property. So that's the rear elevation set into the bank Floor plans, and then these are the visuals. Um, that's how you. That's how it would sit within the site. Um, obviously, we've got sectional drawings. Um, we've got a finished floor level condition recommended, um, and that is the view. That would be the view from the footpath. So it's you know, looking at whether that would impact the principal view that we you know was talked about. It's obviously the opinion of the officer and the conservation officer that it wouldn't impact, um, wouldn't significantly impact this principal view. Obviously, I'm aware of the site um, on Netherlane that's just been refused, and I do think um, that there's a different assessment here. Happy to take any questions. Can I thank the case officer for a report? I found it an extremely interesting site visit uh, yesterday. Um, Members, questions? Uh, Councillor Dobbs, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Oh, it, it was um, interesting. When, when we went to the lane above, we walked along to a gap in the hedge. So I'm quite mystified as how you can have a, a view established when it really depends on how often the hedge gets cut. 
or what time of year it is. So how does that work? Where was the view, bearing in mind the hedge prevents the view being seen until we have that little get, gap where the gate is. So how can you have a, a key view that you must protect, which is what I understand the Kogart and Ebram plan is saying, when in a sense is it, is it would depend upon how often the hedge was cut, whether you could see it or not. Sorry, Chair, through you, if I may. So, effectively, the provisions within the neighbourhood plan about protecting the gap, is that what you were mentioning, Councillor Thomas? That was something that was put forward by the parish as part of the neighbourhood plan. And effectively, that was something that was adopted. So, it, whenever you're dealing with an openness of or a green wedge or an open space within an existing built form, it is subjective and it is also dependent, as you mentioned, in terms of what the boundary features are to that particular paddock, paddocks or open area of land. And you can, unless they're specifically protected or because look, look, look at those hedgerows, they probably are, that the removal themselves could open up that gap. So, difficult for me to try and second guess as to why that was put in there. But it is there, and it's something one must bear in mind, and, and, and we have assessed as part of the report. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Slack, please. Uh, thank you. I think one of my questions has been answered by Sarah. Uh, the ridge height, sorry, sir. The ridge height, is, in your opinion, is, is all right. It doesn't need lowering. I'm comfortable with, with the information that I've got in terms yeah. of the sectional drawings, yes. Yeah. Um, it's that particular one that shows the height of the footpath as yeah. the two lines going towards the chimney. Um, that is, yeah. um, I think, um, how I've assessed it. And that's, yeah. um, you know, it's a scaled plan. Um, I'm comfortable with yeah. it. And also, officially, I've, second, I've sought to condition floor levels. Yeah, my second question is, sorry, um, the agent spoke about water retention, uh, water coming off and, and retaining it. Um, but um, nowadays, as we all know, we suddenly get sudden downpours nowadays with climate change and, and uh, water retention can't be held forever. And is there some sort of water retention which takes the water away from the lane below? Because if it floods onto the lane, uh, there's no gritting in this area like many villages and, and it could be a death trap if it's iced over. In this particular case, they have submitted a flood risk assessment, which yeah. is not required for this level of application that was sent to the flood authority for assessment they've chosen to provide no comment because it it doesn't meet the threshold for their responses um because it is only one dwelling um the the drainage strategy on this is to provide some attenuation and control the flow um, which is a betterment to the situation that exists now. Um, I do, I'm aware that there are sort of highways drainage issues on the road. Um, and that's, you know, that's a different matter. It's just a case of in allowing this, would it increase flood risk? And, you know, from, from the information that we've got, um, it is controlled, which is, is, is a betterment. That's information from the professionals, then, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Uh, Peter O'Brien, please. Uh, Chair, yes, two linked questions. Um, firstly, Sarah, in the um, late um, observations, representations, could, could you help me, please, with um, the, uh, the uh, second... Uh, but second from the last paragraph, when it says the existing bungalow has a ridge height 3.2 metres higher than the proposed property, can you tell us which is the existing bungalow that's being referred to there? I haven't got a pointer, but um, 
to my right, there's um, a ridge height level, and you can see that that bungalow is higher, and that's how I've made that assessment and how I've measured it. I've measured it on the scale plan um, where I've been given the ridge height of, of that neighbouring property. So just just point to me where which where is the bungalow on that? The furthest. Oh, okay, right, I'm with you. Right, my, my second question. That's helpful. Um, my second question relates to the um, suggestion from one of the speakers in relation to uh, ridge height of this uh, dwelling if the application were approved. Would you like to comment on that suggestion? Um, I've assessed the application on the basis of the plans and um, how it impacts on the surrounding area, knowing the ridge heights that are around. Um, I'm comfortable with with the um, the floor level of it, etc., because we have, um, in negotiations, brought it closer to Nether Lane in order to reduce its height, and I feel it's an acceptable level. So you don't think that suggestion has merit? No. Any further questions from members? Councillor Neil Butto, and then, then Councillor Archer. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, there are some concerns here about uh, the flooding in the street outside and the runoff rate, I think it was quoted at something like two litres a second, unless I've forgotten it and got it completely upside down again. Um, um, do we have any, uh, any comment to make on the use of grey water and stuff like that to reduce the uh, flow into the site and therefore reduce the flow out of the site? Sorry, bear with me. I'm just looking for to see if I have got a climate change condition. I, I, I thought I did, um, and whether it could be incorporated in some way, or if not, within um, the drainage condition that I've got. Yeah, condition 19, um, it could be incorporated or um, an informative to suggest. That help matters, do you think, for the, uh, the local environment to reduce the amount of flow that's going into the area or... Would it be a helpful step, or would we be wasting their money? I'm not a drainage engineer. I can't really answer that. Thank you. Councillor Archer, please. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Just a couple of quick ones. Based on the, one of the residents mentioned the sort of conditions, if we were minded to approve it, conditions they'd like us to consider. I think we've already talked about the ridge height, and, and we feel that our officers feel that is already low enough. Uh, but then, and I'm assuming the flood risk report is probably addressed by current condition 11 in terms of what they're asking for for that. They mentioned the construction management plan. Um, so, so first question is, is our condition 11, are we happy with, in terms of the flood risk report? I think we've just had that answer probably. Construction management plan, the, the resident who spoke made a specific reference to a particular building that they felt should be protected from construction vehicles. So just a question on whether we can add that to the plan. Is that something we think is viable from an officer's point of view? And then my second question is that is to do with the highway concerns um, about the visibility. Um, and again, are we happy that that is covered by condition three, which just says development here by approved shall not be occupied until the access parking and turning facilities have been provided as shown in the drawings. I'm just checking that we're happy that does address the concerns that highways raised about visibility. Um, can I answer your last question first and then um, go back to that other one? Um, I, in, in, when I realised, obviously, that the visibility displays couldn't be achieved because of third-party land, I went back to the Highways Authority and um, specifically asked them whether um, they would, you know, whether they felt a, if I used that as a reason for refusal, would it be sustained? And their answer was no. And so um, that is the reason why we've just got Condition 3 and, and not a display condition. 
You okay with that, Nick? Uh, yes, I am. The only other, the other part of the question was about the. the you say you will come back to me on the one about the, the the request for something to be put in the construction management plan to protect certain building from heavy vehicles. It sounded like a very specific, very local thing. That and I would. I just wondered what the officer's thoughts were on that going into a construction management plan. You chair, if I can. Yeah. I mean, yes, we can certainly use a standard form of wording of a, of a chemical construction environmental management plan and add things to it that could include where members might support the application the request for that and with those provisions that was mentioned by the actual applicant sorry the uh, resident as well members we have before us an officer recommendation how do members feel is anyone prepared to move and second this at this point Oh, then are there further questions that members wish to comment? So I await. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councillor Whitehead. I'll, I'll move it, Chair. And does that find a seconder, please? <laughs> it, it, it does, that's, yeah. So it's now open for debate. Uh, I, I'm going to compromise my impartiality <laughs> at this point. Uh, I appreciated the uh, points that were brought to our attention from the residents. But I have to say, I was delighted by the design compared to some of the, I, I don't know whether they were done in the 1970s or 1980s, but, um, you know, this is a very, um, I thought, you know, in keeping um, property uh, in this part of the uh, village. And, um, you know, I seldom say this, but I thought the, Applic uh, the applicant's agent tonight uh, did convey, um, you know, a good case for this application. Uh, others will perhaps have different views, and I don't belittle the points raised by the residents, but, uh, you know, yesterday on viewing this site, I've got to be honest, I, I really felt that this was reasonable. Uh, Councillor Buttle. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I kind of agree with you, David. It looks... It's in the vernacular. Um, I was wondering about the, uh, the grey water issue. I would quite like to take that into consideration for uh, the climate change uh, control. So if, there's, if it's possible, the people who put that forward, um, as uh, whether or not we could either add a note or a condition or whatever, assuming that we, we, we approve. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Lees. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd like to echo your thoughts on that one and again. You know, I think it's a lovely uh, design, lovely building, lovely materials that's going to be used on it. Um, I think Kirk Island is getting its best out of what can be achieved from that site. And I think, again, it just proves a point that the site visit was very important to have that site visit. Mm. But on the other hand, it's quite disappointing when you get 35 letters of objection you have a site visit, and there's no representation from anybody else there. But uh, I fully support the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lees. Uh, Councillor Dobbs. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to thank Mr. Marsh for supplying us with um, some graphics and uh, to appreciate what it is that might be partially obscured. But I agree with people who have said before, this is very much a compromise. It's actually... Uh, done enormous, taken enormous steps to try to fit in as best it can while still having an extra uh, home in this village. And uh, I think actually the, um, it may highlight the issues of flooding in, in, in the lane. And certainly from what I've read of the drainage plan, it will certainly go some way to uh, addressing that because most of the runoff from this site will go actually into the sewer. Um, it, that's how it does it, attenuated via a, a suitable basin. Uh, so it should improve things a bit and maybe highlight with highways that um, there is a problem in the road as well. Thank you. Thank you. Members, it's been moved and seconded that uh, we grant consent. All those in favour, please show. Uh, sorry. Sorry, Chair, just yeah. uh, the, how it's been moved and seconded is with the addition of the Kemp construction yes. and yeah. the grey water attenuation or elements to be incorporated into the... Um, the condition that exists at the moment. That, that's acceptable to Sorry, mover and seconder. No, yeah, all right, thank you. All those in favour, please show. 
that appears to be unanimous. Any, any objections? No. And uh, no abstentions. Thank you, members. That was unanimous. So we're actually now at the fifth application, which will be my last for determination tonight. So we turn to page 63, please. Again, this was a, a very useful site visit uh, yesterday when we viewed um, this land uh, at Ball Hill. It was, I, th I think, requested by Councillor Slack. So thank you, Peter, because it was a very useful site visit. It's the construction of four number short stay holiday accommodation units, amenity building, access road, landscaping, and other associated works. And I think we have. Um, yes, it's Joe Walton, please, the applicant. Joe, you've got five minutes to address the committee, please. I'll leave that for you because you've got... you. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you to everyone that attended the uh, site visit yesterday, despite the weather. Uh, my husband and I moved, uh, we've lived and worked in around Worksworth for over a decade now and finally achieved our dream to move to a house with some land um, about two years ago in the hope to earn a modest income from a small holiday business run from home so that we can have a better work-life balance with our young family. Worksworth is a fantastic town with many independent businesses, the Ecclesbourne Valley Railway Heritage Line and many festivals. Um, but as identified within Worksworth's neighbourhood plan, the town has a shortage of overnight accommodation, <coughs> especially that which doesn't use local housing stock as holiday lets. We intend to source as much as we can locally from building materials, aggregate, aggregates, uh, to our breakfast pack supplies, and will encourage visitors to explore the farmer's market, local pubs and restaurants, especially our local malt shovel. Um, spending more money locally by staying longer, not just stopping on, off, on the way into the Peak District. Our intended target market is mainly cyclists and walking holiday makers, in keeping with the Pedal Peaks initiative. We will provide facilities for bike maintenance and secure storage, and visitors can use our site as the main base for their holiday, being just one mile from the High Peak Trail that links with Route 54 of the National Cycle Network, and easy access to casting water, Cromford Canal and beyond. One Lodge is designed to be wheelchair accessible so that those with physical disabilities may also enjoy Worksworth and the Derbyshire Dales and what they have to offer. We understand that Highfields is within Worksworth's conservation area and our small parcel of land is part of the green vista that forms part of an important, important backdrop to the town. The site is about three quarters of an acre in a five acre field and a wider site of around 10 acres that includes woodland. The site is set back on the top of the hill with the slope of the hillside to the west towards Worksworth. The slope of the field and the woodland are primarily what can be seen from Worksworth and will remain untouched. We have worked hard to minimize the visibility of the site from Worksworth. Groundworks will lower the foundation of the whole site into a cutting and the excavated earth will be used to create buns around the site. This effectively moves the peak of the hill forwards towards Worksworth, maintaining the current look of the hill while hiding a sunken area of dead ground that the lodges will be built upon. As shown by the full front site elevation document and explained within the design and access statement, um, especially Appendix A, Approximately one metre of the lodges will potentially be visible above the mounds from Worksworth. However, existing trees across Oakerthorpe Road already provide a backdrop for the site, limiting silhouetting against the sky. Additional planting of new trees and shrubs will help screen the development and enhance this backdrop so the de details will not be clear from town. From further afield across the valley, such as from the National Stone Centre and beyond into places like Middleton, it is possible that more of the structures will be visible. However, this is at a distance of at least one and a half kilometres or about a mile. 
it is considered that the detail of the development will be too small to be clear and will be seen against the general backdrop of the settled valley of Worksworth town. Even the full five-acre field is difficult to make out at these distances, let alone the three-quarters of an acre site. We would like to point out as well that in the, full front, the front full site elevation document, the elevation drawing of the whole site, which is from the general direction of Worksworth, which is intended to demonstrate how the earth buns and soft landscaping will screen the development, provides a view of the site that is technically impossible to be seen with the naked eye, unless you're using binoculars or flying in a helicopter, due to the significant distance of the site from across the valley. We have proactively engaged with Derbyshire Dales planning officers from the start. We have paid for two pre-apps, including a site visit, and have adapted the design considerably following feedback and consultation comments from the Conservation and Trees and Landscapes officers. We note that the planning officer has recommended that all external materials be approved as a planning condition. We're very open to this and are willing to work with the planning officer in agreeing suitable materials. Access to the site can be achieved easily through the use of public transport and utilising the on-demand Derbyshire Connect bus service. We also have an agreement with our neighbour to allow guests to access footpath, footpath 9, which is on their land directly from ours, enabling visitors to walk into Worksworth. The lodges will provide very similar facilities to a glamping site, but we believe that the design is more in keeping with the surrounding agricultural landscape than yurts, shepherd's huts, walnut-shaped glamping pods or bright white caravans. Jo, I'll have to, I've let you go over time, actually. Oh, sorry, so, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, that's fine. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy, is it? But, uh, okay. So, uh, Sarah, if you could outline the application, please. <coughs> So planning permission is sought for the construction of four um, units of holiday let accommodation. Um, there's the layout there. Um, there's an amenity building set behind them. Um, and obviously the new access road, parking, landscaping, and then a ground-mounted solar array. I haven't got a pointer, so I can't really show you where that is. But, um, <coughs> If I try, if I show you the, um, those are the um, actual holiday let accommodation. Um, there's a visual. That's the amenity building that would sit behind them. And then there's the um, site section plan, which shows you a sort of the the bunding, the height of the height of the accommodation, and how it would sit within the landscape. Um, in terms of policy EC9, the site is considered to be a sustainable location with good links to footpaths, high peak trail and works with town centre. Um, the site's within the conservation area and designed to minimise its visual impact by the landscape, um, on the landscape by the proposed earth buns um, to the front of the units, um, landscaping behind, um, limiting the potential impact of the cabins on the brow and horizon. Subject to conditions recommended in terms of external materials and landscaping, it's considered the proposal is acceptable and would preserve the character and appearance of the conservation area. Um, additional conditions are required by um, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, which aren't in the report, um, to do with breeding birds, lighting, reasonable avoidance measures to safeguard amphibians, reptiles and other wildlife, including brown hare and hedgehogs, and a biodiversity action uh, enhancement plan. Um, it's recommended by the Wildlife Trust. These should be included if the application be approved. Subject, right, uh, sorry, I'll take any questions. Just before we proceed, I have to ask members, are, are you happy to move an extension? Councillor Lees, Councillor Slack, can we move it till 9.30? All those in favour? Yeah, that's unanimous. Please, um, mem members, Councillor Slack. 
<coughs> Thank you, Chair. I have no questions because they've all been answered. Uh, but can I reserve, so, as soon as we come to comments, can I reserve to speak? Y yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nick. Uh, very, quick, Robert, very, very quick question. Um, in terms of sustainability, can we uh, condition an EV charge point on site or, or model, model 2 even? Is that something we can condition? I, I thought in my head then that we already had them, but I'm going to have to check that. Um, just bear with me. Apologies if I've, okay. apologies if I've missed that, sorry. No, I found at 718. I don't mention that, but that certainly could be um, part of it. it. It may be because obviously it's to do with cycling and walking, and that's there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that. And it's, great. it's a great site for all that, but people have got to get there somehow. We'll be in a car, so if we can put an EV charge point conditioning, that would be great as far as I'm concerned. But thank you. Yeah. Councillor Boothroyd. I have um, two little questions. Do we have, in the same way that we do for residential um, developments, do we have a holiday let needs analysis type thing for the district? And my second question is, in the proposed amenity building, what, what are the amenities that are being provided? It's all got a garage door, but I'm not sure what the... Because I believe they've all got toilets and showers and stuff. So what are the amenities? <clears throat> yeah, apologies, I, the, I think the um, applicant did mention it was to do with cycle maintenance. Um, there's a story, it, it's made up of a storage area for compact tractor and ground maintenance equipment. So, um, for the site itself and possibly the wider area, um, bike storage area, zone for the solar panel batteries and averters, and then sort of an open area at the back for bin storage. Councillor O'Brien. Yes, thanks, Chair. It's, uh quite an interesting boundary to the site as on the, uh, the site plan and quite rightly there's uh, a lot of attention being given to the uh, the views from the, the west and Oakerthorpe Road in particular. Do we have any details of the landscaping proposals to the north and south? There's obviously to the north, there's existing trees that will be retained. Um, to the south, obviously, you can't see, but obviously there is a, an existing house and, you know, that's how it will be set. Um, the plan's not good enough to show the outline of the house, but it's an open field and then it, it goes to the curtilage of the house in that direction. I suppose the focus has been from the work with, works with direction to provide the bund um, and to sort of um, blend it into the landscape. There's trees shown on the eastern side that will be at higher above that, and that's shown on the um, illustration. The trees above. So it's the north and south. Are you... Are you Happy we've got sufficient uh, landscaping detail there. I know we've got a landscaping condition, but it's it's only to be submitted and approved um, prior to occupation rather than prior to commencement of works. Um, we can change the trigger of the condition should we should you feel that was necessary. Um, comfortable that you know we we've achieved um 
sufficient landscaping and um, to have that agreed um, during the process of the construction. But if you don't agree, then we could change the trigger. Would you prefer to see that revised? Just a comment because I'm, it's about how the site integrates into the surrounding landscape to the north and south as well as to the east and west. Sean. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Just come back to Councillor Booth, right? The, the question that you asked about the um, do we currently have a, a, <coughs> a local um, holiday accommodation needs assessment? My understanding is we don't, but I can certainly check with policy colleagues about the actual revision to the plan as to whether or not that's been looked at or commissioned or whether or not a requirement was certainly examined. Yeah. Kelda, did you have a supplementary question? Because I cut you short, I do apologise, right? Uh, Councillor Buttle. I was kind of on the same theme. Uh, I rather like this. I think it's a very, a very nice, uh, a very nice idea, and no doubt Derbyshire Wildlife Trust will be busy adding bits and bobs to the north and south. Um, but how do we decide, or when will there was a consultation with our officers? How did we end up with four lodges and not five or three? This is just, you know, this is, <laughs> this is just the same sort of thing as Calder's talking about here. Well, you know, like the demand, are we working to demand? Are we working to the amount of space? Or are we just being careful? Um, the answer is we're being careful. It has been reduced since the pre-app um, down to four. I think I believe it was five to start with. OK. Uh, if that was the case, would we be, would we, well, I, I love this at the moment, so would we, would they need a new application if they were to fit one more at a later date? Yes, they, they would. would. Right, thank you. Members, we've got before us an officer of recommendation to uh, grant uh, this application. Would anyone like to muse it? Thank you, Councillor Franks. And Councillor uh, uh, second it, yeah. Yeah. Right, can yeah. I speak? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Right, because it's in my water. Yeah. Uh, um, I did uh, ask for a, a site visit because I wanted members to look at the surrounding areas. What a lovely area it is, really. Not, not for uh, objecting against it because I'm fully for this. Um, these uh, lodges are really what we require, really, because uh, farms now struggling to... to uh, make a living, really, with the cost of living crisis, and farmers can diversify into this sort of thing for tourism, if they're in the right position, of course. And this is in the right position because it's, as the applicants have said, it's set down and, it, and you can't see it from work stuff at all. Uh, and it's perfect, really, how it's uh, blended into the background. Uh, it's mainly for people that walk and cycle and, and <laughs> bit younger than me, <laughs> obviously, and walk and cycle, and, and uh, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I, I like those lodges. Uh, I, from where I live, I, I can see the mulch over, but I won't be able to see the lodges because they're further down. <coughs> so I, I don't think there's a problem about visibility, people looking over it. But uh, you see, Wordsworth has a policy <coughs> where uh, new build or, or um, alterations as, as a neighbourhood plan is for primary residents. So tourism, uh, we're trying to dis, obviously like um, we want to dispersuade people from buying holiday lets. We want to, because holiday lets take away uh, homes for local people yeah. and that's not right in my opinion. So this is a, a very good compromise for tourism. Yeah. We can develop these sort of things and have more tourism in our area. And I'm, I know words of councillors have uh, said it's outside the settlement boundary, but it's not a, a build, it's a chalice, mm. the tourism. Mm. And it's what we need to require. And now I'm fully supportive of this, so I'm pleased to well, second it in, in this case. Thank yeah. you, Councillor Sack. Yeah. Councillor Archer and then Councillor Booth, Roy. Uh, also very happy with this, I think it looks great. <coughs> um, just coming back to my point of mailing questions, I, I would like, if possible, for us to add a condition to put one or two, even two, ideally, um, EV charge points. They would, don't need to be the high-speed, very expensive ones because people will be leaving their cars overnight. They can just plug them in, leave them over a long period. So uh, if it's possible to condition two, great. I don't know whether we're able to do that. If not, strongly encourage it if we can't condition it. Yep. 
Do you want to respond to that? So, sorry, through you, Chair. Yes, I mean, that's something we can certainly put on as part of the actual uh, recommendation. And also, the potentially, as part of the discussion this evening, I think it was Councillor O'Brien about the triggers to the landscape <coughs> to be altered. Were members to yeah. vote in favour of the application? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, get Councillor Booth Royd and then Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. Um, I asked those two questions for a sort of quite specific reason, which is every single planning committee I think I've attended, there's been a glamping site. And I actually, I, I agree with, I, I like this proposal. However, glamping sites tend to be sort of romantic couple locations of maximum two people with a little kitchen and an ensuite bathroom. And that doesn't address the issue of holiday lets, because <coughs> holiday lets are multiple bedroom properties. I live next door to one which is four bedrooms. Either it's a group of friends who have taken it out with the purpose of then kind of using a large living room and kitchen space, whatever, or it's a family. A family of with young children essentially can't use a glamping site. Um, and that's, that's why I asked the question about the amenity building. It could maybe in future when we consider these sites actually, are we considering this glamping site as a essentially a extra hotel type room which is what a glamping pod is sold on the basis on i just tried to gone through a whole booking camping sites holiday in the netherlands we can't go to these sites so therefore we're taking a tent or staying in holiday in 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 flats in you know there's, there's those two options when you've got children that you can't leave so i think it, it's not I don't disagree with this, and I'd sort of love to put it to the applicants, really, that actually there's already quite a lot of these coming through, and in terms of the demographic that they are suitable for, it could be a risky business model. Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So I just wanted to say I think it's a great application. I think it's really, really strong, what he's trying to bring to the local community really love it. I also think the officer report is excellent. My only disappointment is this has been called into committee. I have no idea, especially Peter's called it in, well, and I, re I respect him for, for, for his right to do that, but officers have passed it, and Peter's supporting it. <laughs> and I just find that illogical and crazy and a bit of a waste of our time. Right then, let's put it. Oh, sorry, yeah, Peter. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to say two things. I thoroughly enjoyed the site visit. It's yeah. a great view. So I wouldn't have got that if I hadn't yeah. been coming to committee. Yeah. And actually, in uh, response to Peter, there, there's quite a bit of hedge planting to the side of that track as we came in. So I think some of the landscaping is already in place. Yeah. Thank you, members, for your contributions. Can we just put it then to the vote, please? It's been moved and seconded that we grant consent. All in favour, please show. And that appears to be unanimous. Thank you. OK, I'll hand over to... I'm going to go and have a drink. Yeah, what I wanted to do is show councillors what can be done. I know, but our time's yeah, precious, yeah, Peter. No, You're no, just wasting our time. It's really... That's really disappointing, mate. No, 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 definitely not. Just just waiting just for David to leave the room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it was good. Councillors, what went on site, was it? They were really pleased with it. Yeah, I know the sign. We've got to move people away from other, by another day lots and villages yeah. into yeah. To that. Move them on to yeah. uh, holiday, holiday bodies. Okay, yeah. members. So we move on to item 5.6, which is application 23 stroke 00637 stroke full. Uh, Dale Road Methodist Church, Darley Dale, erection of link this extension between one. church and church hall, installation of air source heat pump and associated landscaping and external alterations. Um, just to say that members did visit the site yesterday morning with our officer to see the site and its context. Um, we do have four speakers. The first speaker is... Mrs. Ruth Burton, a local resident, to speak in favour of the application. Ruth, you have three minutes. Good evening. I speak as a long-standing member of the congregation of Dollydale Methodist Church, having been involved 
in some way for most of my life. Within that time, I've seen many changes, both internally in the church and externally to the church hall. All of these were undertaken as the work and the needs of the church evolved, leading to the well-used premises that we have at present. We are finding, however, that there is a need for more available meeting rooms in order to avoid turning groups away, and especially for some smaller rooms for various use. This will save heating larger areas unnecessarily, noting that all Methodist churches are being challenged to be carbon neutral by 2030. We're very blessed to have the car parking space that we do, but unfortunately access to the church hall can be challenging for the less mobile and those carrying lots of equipment. This scheme aims to alleviate this problem. I also firmly believe that the provision of accessible toilet facilities at church level is long overdue, as all previous schemes have failed to do this due to internal restrictions. In addition, as a rainbow leader there, I'm involved with the welfare of young children and must stress that when rooms are in multiple use, it's imperative that separate toilet facilities are in operation. So after many years of thinking how we can get around these problems, we've come to the conclusion that the only way to solve them is to grasp the nettle and link the two buildings in the most sympathetic way possible. I believe the architects have worked largely to their brief, bearing in mind the restrictions imposed on them by the significant difficulties to be found around the back of the church hall and lower ground areas. As with many planning applications, the proposed development will affect existing views, but normally the planning officer would advise members that this is not a valid legal reason for refusal. As church members, it is important to us that we are wise stewards of the funding available and that we maintain the integrity of our church buildings as much as possible. We have compromised our needs significantly in removing the proposed external porch from our plans before submitting this application. That was in response to the case officer's comments, but would find it difficult to further compromise if we're to fully achieve our aims. In conclusion, I would urge you to support this application against officer recommendation, bearing in mind that in the final comments of the report found on page 83, item 7.9, it says, however members may come to a different view, which seems to illustrate the subjective nature of this specific application. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. The next speaker is Becky Burton, a local resident, to speak in favour of the application. Thank you, Becky. And you have three minutes to. Good evening, members and officers. I am the unit leader at Darleydale Guides. I work closely with the Rainbows and Brownies and regularly organise large district scale events for around 150 children at a time. In 2019, we moved Rainbows, Brownies and Guides from the Scout Hut in Darleydale as it was worn, costly and no longer lent itself to meet our needs. It has been very beneficial and accommodating for us to move to better facilities at Darleydale Methodist Church Hall at an affordable price and in recent years our numbers have risen and we continue to all have waiting lists. In addition to this, I have also helped out regularly at Messy Church and other family events and would like to do more with the facilities. I'm here to stress that there is a need for increased space and in doing this, it needs to be accessible, flexible and importantly, a safe space for all users. On some weeks, I experience on-site shared hired space where the WI hire the hall and the guides meet in the church. I'm grateful for the space and compromise, but it isn't ideal as I have to transport all the equipment between both buildings, often in the dark and the rain. As proposed in the plans, joining the buildings together would alleviate this problem and make both buildings more accessible and flexible to user groups. The planning application sets out to gain extra rooms and a small church office. 
Knowing the variety of different age range groups currently hiring the facilities, this would enable the church to be able to hire out more to the community groups in a safe space. And it would also mean that I could provide a more varied programme by splitting children into different roomed activities. Volunteering is hard work and time consuming and the office space will really help when each week on site I update my compulsory paperwork online. In my opinion, the church leadership committee have listened to the case officer. They've acted and amended on the points that they have felt able to do so on, such as removing the porch. And for those points that they have struggled with, they have given a reasoned response to the comments to the case officer's email, which was circulated to you all last week. After reading these comments and listening to the representations tonight, please consider this planning application. And whatever the outcome, thank you for the site visit yesterday and thank you to Sarah for her hard work on the application. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Becky, spot on with timing. So the next speaker is Councillor Jason Farmer from Dorleydale Town Council to comment on the application. You two have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening. I represent Dollydale Town Council. The church is an essential community asset and the church has now become the only remaining Methodist church in Dollydale, as the ones both on Dolly Hillside and Hackney have now closed. Dollydale, as we all know, is a growing town with more requirements for this one remaining Methodist church. The church requires this link building to enable the church to simply function in this modern and busy era. The link building will give the church the ability to become a disability access compliant with disabled toilets being available with level access facilities for those disabled visitors. The church regularly hosts funerals and services of around 90 to 100 people with many local organized groups. This promotes well-being within the community. It continues to provide people with an essential local service. Its continued functionality can only be successful if this is the key thing, the building is fit for purpose. This link extension is essential to allow this to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our last speaker is Jeanette Ann Welsh, applicant, to speak in favour of the application, and you have five minutes. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for uh, allowing us to come. Thank you for visiting the site yesterday. Um, on our church hall, you will see that it says serving the community at Dali Dale as part of our mission statement. And our mission actually is to serve the people of Dali Dale. And in line with that, the aims of our proposed development are to comply with the Equality Act and provide better access to the church and the hall for people who use wheelchairs and mobility aids, to provide better toilet facilities for people who have disabilities and others who require a larger toilet facility, to provide two small meeting rooms for committees and other smaller groups to use, also possible individual consultations with community specialists, to enable greater flexibility in the use of the buildings so that a greater number of groups can use the facilities at the same time, and to provide ease of movement from the church to the hall or vice versa when both buildings are being used together. For example, at a funeral tea after a funeral, for overspill during large meetings or gatherings with the aid of a, uh, aid of a video link. We have tried to look at um, details from the planning officer and um, our architectural considerations have tried to compromise. So we have endeavoured to keep the detail on the original buildings, including keeping the end window of the church. Some of the proposed plans are more expensive than a functional approach because we've tried to make our plans sympathetic to the existing architecture. While we recognise the church and hall are in relatively close proximity to Whitworth Park and building, the development of the church and the hall are on the opposite side of the church 
and will not be seen from the Whitworth. Many of the changes seen um, when you are immediately by the church in the hall are obscured by the line of lime trees that surround the church and have tree preservation orders on them. We have, as you have heard, um, compromised on the use of a porch and the lack of the porch externally means that we have an internal porch, making it more difficult for funeral and wedding entrances, as well as limiting the internal space within the church for larger events. We are very keen that we have a linked building that not only provides good level access for people with disabilities and mobility needs, but also enables us to have um, disability friendly toilets for everybody to be, able to be able to access easily. The sole purpose of the plan is to improve the use of the local community. We have an increasing population in Darleydale. We have many new houses built over the last decade and we have an, a larger than average population of older people. Those who've lived there all their lives and are getting older. Those who've moved into the community um, from out with um, Derbyshire and those who've moved in from local villages because they want to move to a, an area with better facilities and shops and public transport. While Darley has the Whitworth um, to hire, because of the upkeep required for that, it has to charge higher prices and many local community groups can't afford to meet there. There's no village hall in Darleydale and therefore the church hall has been proudly serving the local community for many years. Groups including Wildlife Trust, Peak Rail, The Ramblers, Rainbows Guides, Film Club, Evergreen Club, WI, Stitch, Knit and Natter, Horticultural Society, Dali and Bloom, and Thursday lunch clubs for people who um, need to come out from their houses and ha have lunches and, and meet with others. So they're, they're just part of what we provide. We also provide functions for local um, groups who might want to meet there for funeral teas or dinners or um, people have hired it for their Christmas dinners and things like that. So we, we try and provide for the local community, not just as a, a worship facility for our members. The Equality Act means that we should be making reasonable provision to accommodate people who are less mobile. And as many older people attend activities in the hall or church, it's important to provide better access to the buildings. But also from a human dignity perspective, to have better access to adapted toilet facilities. Currently, if somebody with a disability attends a funeral at the church, for example, we have to put down a temporary ramp to get them in and out of the church, and then take them from the church down a steep slope to the hall where the adapted toilet is. The proposal for better access and the link with toilet facilities would make life much easier for the person who has enhanced needs and also people who need to escort and care for them. Often not because they need that support for any other reason than negotiating the buildings and the slopes. Could I ask you to draw your right. remarks to a close? Right. Please? Thank we, you. We, we believe that the benefits outweigh your harm. Um, it's an attempt to make the building usable by everybody within our local community and as such we would respectfully ask councillors to support the planning application and provide better facilities for the people of Darley Dale. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I could hand over to the case officer, Sarah, please. <clears throat> Right. Um, so the proposal relates to an existing community use within the settlement boundary of Darley Dale. Proposals to Crohart is required to improve access to the church hall and church for its existing users for the benefit of the community. The proposal would provide a link between the two buildings and provide level access to the link building um, via a raised patio area. Um, specified in plastic lumber in order to pr improve the use of the two buildings for the existing community uses and provide access for disabled people. Um, it's con considered that the church qualifies as a non-designated heritage asset and concerns have been raised with regard to the design of the link building. It's considered to appear bulky, out of character and would obscure original features of the church. 
it's considered, in, in terms of the balancing exercise in the report, it's considered that a harm to the significance of this non-designated heritage asset <coughs> outweighs the public benefits. I'll take any questions. Councillor Whitehead. Thanks, so. Sarah. Uh, I was wondering, you, could you just tell us a little bit more about what the link building's made of? What's, what's the roof made out of? Are, are, they deliberately, are we deliberately going for a modern style to distinguish between the two building types, like we do on some properties? Or are they trying to keep it kind of, are they trying to blend it? It doesn't look very, kind of, that, that picture doesn't present it in its best light, I don't think. It, it is a, a bit of a combination. It is picking, it is <coughs> going to be stone with a sort of metal clad roof. It's going to have windows that are stone surround. So it's, um, it is designed in a traditional way rather than a modern. Right. And, and I just wondered, maybe a bit, I just wanted to, could you just tell us a little bit more about this non-designated heritage? Obviously, we've talked a lot about heritage tonight. We've turned down a planning application already because of it. How does heritage play into this uh, thing? And what do we need to be aware of before making our decision? Um, it's really based on the comments of the archaeologists and its significance, its um, you know its features and how it can you know how it's read um in terms of the the Whitworth and the associated buildings with that its age all of those come into the round and a judgment has been made that it it would qualify as a non-designated heritage asset and there's an assessment and a balance exercise in which you carry out between weighting the harm against the public benefit Thank you. Councillor Archer. Uh, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> um, just in, in the notes to applicant uh, section, it comments that positive and proactive dialogue was, was um, engaged with between officers and applicants, but then says no changes were made. It's, it's, a, it's a similar sort of direction of questions we've already had, but, but the speakers seem to suggest that they were being as sympathetic as possible. So from an officer's point of view, what were we hoping for? What, what changes would we wanted to see for it to be seen to be acceptable by officers. Um, suggestions were made on site about a glazed link where um, it wouldn't obscure the features of the church. It would allow views down into the cemetery. Um, but unfortunately, the requirements of the internal space mean that they couldn't achieve any of that within a glazed building or glazed link. Councillor Slack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, um, it's traditional, you, you said, Sarah. It looks traditional. Well, it's coming from a traditional church, at, uh, a building which is uh, quite old, really, isn't it? The uh, link building it's going to. So I can't see the problem in being traditional in that way because it's coming from a traditional church going to to link up with a much older building it's not somewhat modern where a glass link would be in keeping from a modern building it's an it's a traditional building so therefore i don't see the rel relative aspect in that so uh, I, yeah i don't agree with that thank you councillor franks I'm, I'm fascinated by this closeness to the Whitworth buildings because there's, we've got the chapel um, the other side of the chapel there is some cemetery that is in, in part of the original building of the chapel it's a piece of cemetery then we've got this really ugly massive car park and then you've you know sort of almost quarter of a mile up the road you've got the Whitworth building and the pub um, and I just find it incredulous that we can be considering turning down an application where, it, to me, I can't see the link between the two buildings. You can hardly see one from the other. And I, and I would be interested in your comment on that. Well, it's, as I said, it's based on the archaeologists' um, assessment of it, and it's an, it's an association. 
it's an association in terms of significance rather than location. Um, that's all I would say. Councillor O'Brien. Yes, thank you, Joe. I've got a question on the detail, uh, one aspect of the detail design there. That is the um, ridge line of the, um, of the link, uh, which is uh, contiguous with the ridge line of the, of the church hall, which, which to me I find a bit disappointing. Is, is that ridge line at that height uh, because of the accommodation needs of the link, or is it what the architect has required. It's, it's constrained about what needs to fit into the link, I think. So it's probably a bit of both. It may be that the, that was felt the, the correct way to, to do it, to, to just join it. Um, I don't know the thinkings behind it, um, but um, it, it, it seems to be a lot to do with the accommodation that it provides. The Whitehead, second go. So, no, it was just a point of clarity, really, just off Marilyn's point, because I thought you'd brought the Whitworth into it just in terms of other relevant builders, not for a reason to refuse this. Marilyn seems to suggest that the reason for refusal was because of the Whitworth or the close proximity. I didn't see... That, is, that's, not, that's not right, is it? No, it's it's how the archaeologist has assessed it. Um, it's within my report. He's, you know, he's he's made that association um, in terms of its age. It's an association with the Whitworth. It's that's all it is. Members, are there any other questions? If not, we'll move to the debate. Does anybody wish to put a proposal forward? It has been recommended for refusal by the officer. Councillor Franks. Um, I would actually propose that we um, accept the application and uh, go against the officer's recommendation for this particular planning application. Does that find a second there? Councillor Slack, do you wish to say something? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I think it's tradition, same as it is, it's a traditional church, it's a traditional link. I can't see a problem with it at all. A, a Graceling would have been out of, out of uh, character altogether. So uh, I'm, and uh, looking over the cemetery, a lot of people don't want people staring down at them when they attend to go into the grave. It, you know, it wants a bit of privacy. So I think it's, they've got, they've got it right, personally. So I'll uh, support uh, uh, Marilyn on the uh, proposal, on a recommendation, and second it. Councillor Boynton. Thank you. Um, I, I was unsure yesterday at the site visit um, about this proposal. But having listened to the speakers tonight, um, I think they've ticked an awful lot of boxes. Um, they've got a thriving community hub here uh, and the need for extra space. Um, without get, giving them the extra space, um, there's potential that this could fail and we'll end up with another church with an application for turning it into a dwelling. Um, it ticks loads of boxes, um, complying with the Equality Act, uh, well-being of the people using it, providing an essential service, making it fit for purpose compared to what it is now. Um, there's no village hall. It provides a great service for Darley, Darley Dale, uh, and I should be voting in favour of the proposal. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dobbs. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to echo some of uh, Councillor Boynton's points. Uh, the, the need isn't in debate, is it? I mean, this is clearly a good idea to join these two buildings. It's just a question of what's the relative harm that this causes. I'm not a fan of Gothic revival anyway, I'm afraid. So I, uh, I'm, you know, wonder at the harm to this building that is being caused. I think they actually integrate fairly well. These things are always difficult to do, and we could have endless designs, all of which would have some sort of compromise. I think this is pretty close, and I see no reason to refuse it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, I almost agree with everything that John had said. And, uh, but 
I just think the design's awful. <laughs> I think it's absolutely dreadful. I think how they've linked it just on, on what's presented to us, it's poor. And the lack of regard for the current heritage, the fact that we went on about heritage so much tonight, and yet now we're so quick to disregard it, when our officers have highlighted to us, the archaeologist has highlighted to us, this is going to make kind of damage to the kind of the heritage ashes to the building. Um, I find it puzzling that we're so quick to disregard that. I don't disagree with the need. I just think that they could come back with a much better design. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Chair. Well, I agree. I would say I agree with the sentiments expressed by Councillor Whitehead. Um, I can understand why officers have reached the, um, their recommendation, um, but it is, a, it is a challenge to, to meet the, the differing needs of the church and the church hall um, and, and find an acceptable architectural solution. We've got two very different buildings. You, you could not get more different buildings. And uh, clearly, the, when the uh, church hall was um, uh, designed and located, uh, the, uh, the view, the space between the two buildings was seen as quite paramount. And uh, we're therefore now um, affecting that, uh, that, that shook to position. Uh, and that's why I asked the question about the, 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 the roof line there. Uh, I have to say, to me, the, uh, the fact that we have a, 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 a very modest, uh, very Methodist uh, stone church building, and, and then, a, uh, if you like, a rather ordinary brick-built church hall, suggests to me that um, the, 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 the roof line, which carries on that um, church hall roof line, um, probably is not the best articulation. I would prefer to see a, a, a height a height difference there, which I think would have uh, would have helped uh, re retain the uh, if you like the architectural distinction between the two buildings. However, that's uh, this is what we're 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 presented with, and I have to say I'm very fond of saying to my colleagues in the Peak District that uh, places places evolve. And uh, we, we need to accept that. And this is an evolution. Uh, it's different. Uh, but as I said, you know, places need to evolve to survive. So, so on that basis, I don't feel that I want to uh, object to this application. I just feel that there, I have, to, I have to say that I think there is a better architectural solution than, than we, the one we have before us. Councillor Bottle. Uh, thank you very much. I was going to try not to say anything about something. <laughs> Maybe I should press on. Uh, I'm with Peter. I think it's just a bit odd the way they sort of run one into the other. It just doesn't feel right to me. Uh, I don't think I can support it, even though it's kind of an obvious solution. Uh, the use of stone and uh, zinc... Yeah, it, it does break the two up or break the three up. But yeah, I'm not a massive fan, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak in the debate? Councillor Frank, second go. Yeah. Uh, just to, I suppose to sum up a little bit, um, I think this, it's a, we're in danger of, of losing a very valued community asset in Dorleydale. Um, I think the architect has attempted, as, as has been said, that you've got two very, very different buildings, um, a very 1970s yellow brick village hall um, with no distinctive features, uh, and then uh, the Methodist church with some quite beautiful stonework in places. And I think the architect has tried to um, use natural stone he's tried to um use face stone and uh coins around the windows to try to blend it in somehow uh it is essential that these two buildings have to be connected there has to be accessibility for disabled 
and the increasingly elderly population that it serves. Um, it will also, as well as improving accessibility, it's going to give the additional space that's needed. Um, and I think they've been very careful and, and tried to um, create smaller rooms so that they can uh, adapt the building, make it more environmentally sound for the future. They're trying to future-proof it. And I think without it, this building's going to be lost and we're going to either see flats or another house and just... And the only community asset that Dollydale have will go. And so I, I'd strongly recommend to people to... to um, uh, vote for acceptance. Thank you. Thank you. So for what it's worth from the chair, I do accept that this is probably not a perfect solution to a problem, but I think what we have to do on hoping that members will um, consider the benefits and consider the disbenefits and make their decision on whether they think the benefits outweigh the disbenefits, which I happen to agree with. Has been moved and seconded for approval against officer recommendation. So I am going to take the vote. All those in favour? And against? Abstentions, please. Well, that's carried. Um, yes. Um, Sean would like to suggest some conditions. Um, sorry, Chair. I, I know we're just looking at Kerry. Uh, am I okay just to suggest some conditions now, even though the vote's been taken? Um, sorry. <coughs> I've just, we've just made a, a quick note of some of the potential conditions that can go on there. Members are happy to uh, approve these. So there'll be the standard time requirement, approved plans condition, construction hours for the actual link, tree, pres uh, tree protection, window details, external details to be agreed, uh, construction details that are about the church, the church hall, bat mitigation licensing requirement, the church bat roost avoidance measures, biodiversity en enhancement, breeding and birds requirement, and lighting. So there's 12 conditions there if members are minded to agree those. Are we happy to agree those? So the decision stands for approval. Yes. Is, is that okay? Do we, do we all agree with those yes, conditions? Please, yeah. 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 And against <laughs> and abstentions. I'm going to take the abstentions again. Thank you. You know, I always forget that. I thought I always got away with it this time. I thought I'd remembered. <laughs> okay. okay, members, we will uh, conclude the meeting now when we <clears throat> move to page 89 on the agenda, which is the appeals now pertaining the information there, does any member wish to uh, make any comments at all? Councillor Buttle, uh, Councillor Lees and then Councillor O'Brien, please. I don't know if we're moving acceptance on these, but I have to say I find them very satisfactory. <laughs> Would you like to move, uh, Councillor Buckley? Yes, please. Well, thank you. <laughs> Does that find a second? Uh... Oh, sorry, right. Councillor Lee is. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. <laughs> totally agree with what uh, Neil said. Um, it, it just gives you a bit of encouragement. I mean, we have recently we've had some very difficult decisions to make, and it's nice to see that um, when these things do go to appeal, that uh, everyone we've got on the list this week, this month, has been dismissed, so uh, yeah. we are making some right decisions. Yeah. 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 So, Councillor O'Brien. Yeah, I want to echo that, Chair. I, I particularly want to uh, draw everyone's attention to two um, two appeals. The the Bradley Hall one, where we spent a lot of time discussing 
which is another heritage um, project. We spent a lot of time discussing the merits and demerits of this application and uh, reached a, uh, I think it was a unanimous view at committee that uh, the installation of these roof lights was, was totally inappropriate to, to Bradley Hall. And that's uh, been upheld by the inspector. I think that, uh, I hope that encourages our officers uh, to, um, uh, in, the, in the way they look at uh, listed building applications. And the, um, the tree application uh, here, the tree root application. Now, we don't often consider TPOs at that committee, uh, but I think if you, if you read, I'd urge everyone to read this uh, appeal decision. It's, it's really interesting. It gets into detail of, of how to, uh, how to uh, uh, look after tree root systems or how not to look after tree root systems and how important they are to, uh, to our treescape. So uh, I'd echo comments, but I find those two appeal dismissals uh, uh, particularly interesting, particularly welcome. Thank you, Councillor O'Brien. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favour that we accept the report, thank you. And can I thank members for their contributions uh, tonight and to our officers. Uh, and I conclude the meeting at 9.25. Thank you. Not too bad at all. <laughs> I it was a bit slow. <laughs> Yes, I've been up to seeing that. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, I haven't made any no, 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 kind of no, 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 no,